Oh oh. <laughs> Went, we're being asked to not use video. Oh. All right, I'll cancel that. We're in the witness protection plan, Wit. Yeah, you could have remained anonymous. <laughs> morning, Doug. Good morning. Hi, guys. We're, we're just about to start. Um, I'm James Carter. I'm here kind of doing the, the tech support end of this uh, for the digital meeting. I just think once again, wanted to ask. Uh, that everyone make sure that once you join the meeting that you've muted yourself unless you're a board member or a presenter and it's not, and it's, you know, necessary for you to speak that helps cut down on background noise and sort of like, you know, uh, unexpected sounds and uh, feedback and stuff like that. And also, if you could disable your video, I can also from the admin end disable video and mute you. So uh, if I see your video on and you, I, I may just shut it off myself. Um, but uh, please, please, you know, try to remember to disable that yourself when you join in. Uh, and if uh, also double check if you're attempting to speak, um, make sure to look on your screen and check that you're unmuted um, before, you know, you try to talk. Um, and that should be about it. Again, we're asking that, you know, uh, anyone here from the public um, that you please keep yourself muted. Um, if you are uh, someone who is, you know, uh, has the potential to be called upon to, you know, speak on one of the nominations when it comes up. We'll we'll sort of ask for that uh, when the time is appropriate. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, it looks like we do have a quorum, Doug. So uh, if you wanna, we can go ahead and uh, begin the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I will call the meeting to order at 10:04 uh, a.m. On Thursday, March 11th, this is the welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the 183rd meeting of the New York State Board for Historic Preservation. We have a contingent of people at People's Island Auditorium. Most of us are joining this meeting remotely through WebEx because the open meetings law is still suspended because of the COVID situation. Uh, we are beginning with the welcome and call to order and we will move into the roll call. Uh, during the roll call, I would ask that uh, uh, review board members briefly introduce themselves and explain what their role is on the board. And if uh, Kathy will lead us through the roll call. Okay. Oh, actually, or, or, yeah. or Daniel. Or Daniel. Yep. Daniel will do that. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board and members of the public. Today, I serve as deputy commissioner for historic preservation for New York State and deputy state preservation officer. I am stepping in today uh, on behalf of our uh, secretary, Michael Lynch, uh, who um, uh, is not able to participate uh, directly in today's meeting. Uh, so I will be playing the secretarial functions uh, as well. As such, uh, the roll call, um, I will go down, call your name if you would briefly introduce yourself or confirm that you're on the call uh, and uh, briefly provide the context for your uh, participation on the state review board. So Doug Pirelli. I'm currently chair of the State Review Board. Uh, I have served several terms as a board member. Uh, I serve in a role as archaeologist on the State Review Board. Uh, its composition requires two people with experience in, in archaeology. I'm a clinical assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Buffalo. I also serve as president of the New York Archaeological Council. Thank you, Doug. Went to Aldrich. Uh, this is Wint Aldrich. I'm, I think, classified as a historian uh, on the board. Uh, I've served for a number of years as Deputy Commissioner for Historic Preservation uh, for, uh, as the, for 40 years as the town historian of the town of Red Hook, uh, deeply involved in history and in architecture. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Wint. Carol Clark. Good morning. I'm uh, Carol Clark. I'm an adjunct professor of historic preservation at Columbia University. I also teach at Pratt Institute and New York University, and I have a graduate degree in historic preservation. Um, and I'm also pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Jay DiLorenzo. Hi, I'm Jay DiLorenzo. I'm the president of the Preservation League of New York State. We're the statewide not for profit historic preservation organization. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Kirsten Heron. 
Hi, this is Kristen. I serve as a representative of the New York State Council on the Arts, where I am the program director for architecture and design and museums. Thank you, Kristen. Erica Krieger, Krieger, excuse me. Yes, good morning. I am Erica Krieger. I am uh, the assistant director for the variance unit over at the Department of State Division of Building Standards and Codes. I am here as a representative for the Secretary of State, Rosanna Rosado. I am a licensed architect. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Jennifer Lamack. Good morning. Um, I'm Jennifer Lamack. I'm the chief curator of history at the New York State Museum. I have served on the board now for 10 years. I looked that up this week. And um, I serve as the representative to the Commissioner of Education. Thank you, Jen. Wayne Goodman. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Wayne Goodman. I am the executive director of the Landmark Society of Western New York, which is a uh, regional preservation organization, and we're based in Rochester. So happy to be here. Thanks. Tom um, Mag serving as proxy for Lucy Waletsky. Yes, I've been involved with uh, state parks and historic sites as appointed by the governor for about 25 years, and I hold a PhD from RPI in Troy. Thank you, sir. Chuck Vandry. Good morning. I'm Chuck Vandry. I'm an archaeologist and the, the historic preservation officer for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and I have been on the board about 25 years, I think. And I am the proxy for the Commissioner of Environmental Conservation, Basil Sagos. Thank you, Chuck. Paul Stewart. Paul Stewart is absent. So, Doug, uh, there being 10 members participating, a quorum has been confirmed. Thank you, Daniel. We move to our next agenda item, which is the approval of the December 2020 minutes. These have been circulated to members of the board. Uh, if you've had a chance to read them, does anybody have any questions or comments or corrections for the December 2020 minutes? I have a motion to move. I have a motion to accept the minutes as printed. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, okay, so we have a motion and a second. Are there any objections or abstentions? There being none, uh, that motion is approved by unanimous consent. This is the process that we'll be using for the national uh, review nominations as well. Um, this motion second and asking for objections and abstentions because of the uh, WebEx format. Doug, may I confirm who was the second on that motion? Please. I have, I have Tom Maggs as the first making the motion. Who is seconding that? It's Carol Clark. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. All right, the minutes are approved. We can now move on to the introduction of our guests. Uh, mm -hmm. I have that. Okay. okay. This is Cassie Howe. Okay. I'm head of the survey and national register unit here at the SHPO. Uh, we're so happy, first of all, happy spring to everyone. Um, and welcome to all of our guests, uh, all of our visitors joining us today. We're so glad you could be here with us. We've got a um, a wonderful diverse group of people out there. We're not going to go through, to save time, we're not going to go through individual introductions at this time. Um, but when, if you are representing as a property owner, a consultant, or a sponsor of a nomination, when that nomination comes up at the end of the presentation, you know, uh, you can uh, introduce yourself at that time. I do want to give uh, a welcome to um, some of the SUNY Albany students who are joining us today. Um, they are in John Bonafidi's historic preservation class. So welcome SUNY Albany. And it's always wonderful to have uh, students with us as well. Um, so I think now we'll move next to the deputy commissioner's report. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I want to take this time. Uh, there's a, a fair amount of material here in my notes. I will try to move through it quickly. Um, this is sort of a, a review of uh, 2020 accomplishments at the Division for Historic Preservation uh, and a look at um, uh, some significant uh, priority projects. Uh, the work of this board in 2020 uh, resulted in uh, adding over 3,000 properties across 38 counties to the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, so the National Register program continues to be uh, in great use. 
and uh, of course, uh, additional nominations ahead today. Uh, the Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. This is a joint federal and state uh, tax credit incentive. Uh, over 1,000 projects uh, have been completed or are substantially underway since 2011. We have completed or underway projects in 60 of, 60 or of 62 New York State counties. And the 1,000 projects that have been logged uh, since Governor Cuomo came into office have incentivized over $12 billion in private investment in historic property redevelopment, creating over 65,000 jobs over the past five years, according to National Park Service data. So a tremendous, a tremendous milestone for that program to reach uh, the $12 billion investment level. Compliance reviews. Uh, this year, uh, despite COVID and despite uh, a downturn in certain components of the uh, state economy, uh, the Compliance Office has been reviewing uh, nearly 19,000 submissions for historic preservation or archaeological review. Triggered by these are reviews triggered by federal or state permitting or funding. Uh, solar. I want to note that solar power development is a significant growth area in our review portfolio, and I want to uh, appreciate the work of the archaeology and survey units uh, to diligently facilitate the review of renewable energy projects in New York State. Uh, both with um, uh, cultural resource management companies and renewable energy companies in order to meet the state's renewal, uh, renewable energy goals. Uh, our statewide awards program, typically hosted in person after our December State Review Board meeting, uh, went to a virtual format this year. Uh, it was announced, the, the slate of awardees was announced in January. There were 11 projects selected ranging from an 18th century Dutch barn rehabilitation to an artist installation memorializing black lives at John Brown Farm State Historic Site and a host of other awards. Uh, that awards, uh, uh, the awards press release can be found online at the governor's uh, website um, uh, or is available from staff here at the State Preservation Office as needed. Um, I wanna highlight some specific work uh, and transition at the Bureau of Historic Sites. That is the Bureau within the Division for Historic Preservation that provides technical support to the historic site system within the New York State Parks Agency. Um, the transition is, is notable in many ways. Uh, we've had the appointment of Greg Smith as our acting director of the Bureau of Historic Sites. We have hired Lavada Nahan as our first interpreter of African American history. We've had system -wide training for historic sites interpretation using dialogic techniques to engage the public and match site history with current events and social topics. Uh, the Bureau of Historic Sites has a new role in capital project planning and capital project selection for the state historic site system. We have plans to hire our first ever interpreter of Native American history, and we have reestablished uh, a statewide historic sites conference that provides professional growth, uh, professional training to the staff within our historic sites network. And uh, while that uh, conference is moving to an online format this year, uh, it will be in two weeks, and we are looking forward to <coughs> convening our agency staff uh, statewide to focus on historic sites management, planning, interpretation, et cetera. Finally, in the category of transition within the Bureau, we have um, acquired, uh, after many years of, of uh, anticipation, a cloud-based collections management system that will advance collections management at both sites and here at the Bureau of Historic Sites and will dramatically impact public research and public access uh, to our collection. Uh, there is a new generation of master planning happening at our state historic sites. We have completed a master plan for Johnson Hall. We have a master plan for Schoharie Crossing underway and we have uh, a master plan uh, being, uh, we anticipate a master plan uh, for the Susan B. Anthony site and or the John Brown Farm site uh, uh, as, as next in the queue. We have elevated the presence for the Division for Historic Preservation and master planning at other state parks with historic assets, such as Nissaquag River State Park, uh, location of the former Kings Park Psychiatric Facility. And quite notably, our first governor's priority project, the transformation of Phillips Manor Hall in the Taconic region to serve as the state's Museum of African American History. This will be our agency's first historic site dedicated to the interpretation of African American history and it will open in 466 days. Uh, in personal news, personnel news, um, I want to note that uh, Division Director Michael Lynch has been out on an extended leave, but expects to be reporting back to work at the division 
uh, on or about March 22nd, and we look forward to his return. And uh, John Bonafidi has told the agency of his plans to retire after more than 30 years of service, uh, culminating in his current role as Director of the Technical Preservation Bureau and Agency Preservation Officer. I would ask that the board uh, prepare uh, in the interim between this meeting and June a resolution recognizing John's significant service and accomplishments with this agency. And I think that's going to mean more homework for the students on the call going forward. So that is my report, Doug. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we move next to the State Historic Preservation Plan review by Dan McEnany. Thanks, Doug. So we are officially rounding the corner and wrapping up our draft submission for the 2021-26 Preservation Plan. Uh, this is due April 1st after a very generous uh, extension provided by the National Park Service uh, due to COVID. Uh, our extension really was built around the need to uh, have more time for data collection. Uh, there was a lot going on um, during the period, not just um, certainly the pandemic, but our organization's you know, capacities to respond and engage. Uh, we have over, you know, 4,000 responses from individuals, uh, community groups, organizations, colleagues uh, that have helped form the plan. I'm going to read you a list of some of the chapters, and I'm asking the board to think about some of these chapters, and please reach out to either Daniel or I if you would like to be a reader within the next couple of weeks of one of these sections. The chapters are organized around goals and objectives in the areas of Diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Preservation partnerships. Resiliency and recovery. Economic growth. Local preservation. Resource identification. And public outreach and education. The plan will include subsections on our historic sites. Uh, not a requirement of the plan, but as our historic site system is within the uh, Division for Historic Preservation, we're pleased to include a lot of information that will help our colleague groups. We'll have special sections on archaeology and technology, plus robust dependencies that include sources of funding, uh, as well as lists of colleague groups. Uh, we're really excited to be wrapping this up. Uh, this plan is going to include the seeker process, so it really builds out a lot of public comment. Uh, before our next meeting, this board will receive a copy of the draft nomination. Uh, by that point, I don't know if we'll have the comments back from the National Park Service, but um, we are encouraging you to participate in what you see uh, to produce the best final document that is, is not a plan for Division for Historic Preservation, but a plan for all New Yorkers. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, could you um, repeat the due date? Sure. April 1st is when we're going to be sending the National Park Service our draft uh, of, of the preservation plan. And then that would be a good target date to circulate information to the board? Uh, yes. At that point, we should be able to get that out to the board. So you'll have plenty of time before the next state review board to, uh, to review that. All right, and then in the interim, I'll work with the board uh, to help people select chapters and sections of that that they're most interested in so that we can provide meaningful comments and assist in the, the process and the development of that document. Great, that would be very helpful. Excellent, thanks, Dan. Um, I guess we're moving next to National Register Reviews, and we appear to be uh, a little ahead of schedule here, which is good, because this might take a long time. Thanks, Doug, this is Kathy Howe. Uh, we do have a very full agenda today, so we'll get started shortly. Um, I just wanted to always share this wonderful slide showing the distribution of nominations that we'll be uh, featuring today, the distribution throughout the state. And um, also want to thank our National Register mentors, Bill Crattinger, Dan McEnany, and Cass LaFranc, and a thank you to James Carter for offering tech support we do have one um, alteration to the agenda or to the nomination roster today. Number three, the Rockland Silk Mill in Hornell, Steuben County, um, has been pulled from the agenda um, to allow time for the um, owner to submit new photos for that. So we'll probably be seeing that in a subsequent meeting. 
Um, the Rockland Silk Mill um, will not be uh, viewed today. Okay, with that, let's get started with Jen Wachowski in taking off uh, showing the Buffalo Club. All right, good morning, everybody. So the Buffalo Club is significant as the preeminent men's social club in Buffalo. From its founding in 1867, the Buffalo Club has been a center for commercial and industrial leadership in Buffalo and greater Western New York, where governmental, commercial, and social elite gathered to relax, play, and discuss significant political, industrial, and community development decisions. These opportunities for connection with fellow wealthy high society gentlemen made membership in the Buffalo Club highly prized. The Buffalo Club is being nominated under Criterion A in the area of social history. Next slide. After operating the organization out of several earlier clubhouses during its first two decades of existence, the club took ownership of the former Stephen Van Rensselaer Watson Mansion at 388 Delaware Avenue in 1887 and made it their permanent home. This house served as the nucleus for substantial later development. Next slide. The 116,000 square foot clubhouse was built in at least 10 different phases over the course of 144 years. The oldest portion of the building at the far eastern end of the property is the three story former private residence constructed in 1870 in, in the second empire style of which George Allison is thought to have been architect. In 1889, a large three story addition designed by architects Green and Wicks and matching style was built onto the rear of the house, nearly doubling the square footage of the building. This addition contained a billiard room, dining room, servants' quarters, and a culinary department. In 1898, a massive three-story Green and Wicks athletic annex was constructed at the rear of the property, providing the club with a gymnasium, bowling alley, swimming pool, baths, barbershop, and other amenities. Other additions followed throughout the years, the most recently completed in, in 2014. Next slide. So the Buffalo Club was modeled after elite men's social clubs in London and cities like Washington, Philadelphia, and New York. Member families were invited to major social events at the club, which were high, the highlight of Buffalo's high society year, and their public activities were written about extensively in local and national newspapers. Members of the Buffalo Club have been many of the city's most prominent civic and business leaders, including former U.S. Presidents Millard Fillmore and Grover Cleveland, Wells Fargo founder William G. Fargo, U.S. District Attorney William Dorsheimer, Surgeon Roswell Park, Lumber Barons Charles and Frank Goodyear, Woolworth Department, co Department Store co-founder Seymour Knox, and Lackawanna Steel magnate John Albright. Many Buffalo mayors and council members were also members, and numerous political leaders held exclusive speaking engagements at the club. These same leaders were deeply involved in the planning of Buffalo's community development, including the Olmsted Design Park and Parkway Systems and the Pan American Exposition of 1901. The clubhouse was the site of many formal and informal national events surrounding the Pan American Exposition. After President William McKinley was mortally wounded by an assassin's bullet while visiting the exposition in 1901, then Vice President Theodore Roosevelt utilized the club as the temporary seat of the federal government. Today, the Buffalo Club continues to be a prominent social club in the community. Next slide. Next slide, please. Just a second, Jen, one second. Okay. Okay. The period of significance for the Buffalo Club. Whoops. The period of significance for the Buffalo Club begins in 1887 with the purchase of the former Watson Mansion at 388 Delaware Avenue and includes the peak of the club's considerable local and regional power, as well as all of the nominated properties 19th and 20th century building campaigns. As the club remains in operation, the period of significance concludes at the 50 year mark in 1971. This also corresponds with the beginning of the era of economic, political and social decline of the city of Buffalo, when the city fell out of national prominence and into economic decline resulting in a subsequent decline in membership and influence. So this is the Buffalo Club. Are there any questions on this project? Questions or comments from the board about the Buffalo Club? Uh, this is Jay. Um, Jen, I thought this was a, a great uh, a great nomination. I know the I know the property is certainly worthy of of listing. Um, one one small comment that I had and I don't know maybe you can kind of say explain this on in section eight on page one we call the 
the, we talk about some of the other clubs that were formed from spinoff of the Buffalo mm-hmm. Club, people that left, and specifically the Park Club, and we reference it as shadowy. And I wondered if shadowy was kind of a good term to have in there or kind of maybe what we meant by shadowy and if we wanted to, to kind of change that. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not too familiar with the club itself um, since that was sort of a peripheral comment to this yeah. particular project, but um, we can definitely look into that and make sure that that's an appropriate term with, you know, for that particular club. Yeah. That, it just, it just seemed like, it just it just kind of caught my attention. Yeah, perhaps a little editorial. <laughs> we'll we'll take a yeah. we'll take a closer okay. look at that and and find an appropriate term. Thank you. Oh, okay, that's all I had. Uh, following up on that, this is Doug Pirelli. I just uh, wanted to observe that the Saturn Club was another one of those other clubs mentioned, and is was kind of an offshoot for the less conservative, more radical, <laughs> more liberal members of. Uh, of the offspring of members of the Buffalo Club. I thought that was interesting. The Saturn Club is one I've been in. I have not been inside the Buffalo Club. Also, uh, Section 8, page 12 mentions that uh, it wasn't until 1988 that uh, two women and, and a black person were admitted uh, to inclusion in the club, and I think that's that's noteworthy. Uh, other questions or comments from the board? Do I hear a motion? This is Jay. I'll, I'll move it. Do we have a second? This I'll is second Erica. It. I'll second. Or I'm, I'm gonna, I heard Erica second that for the record. Uh, and do it. Is there any objection or abstention? There being none. Uh, this is approved by unanimous consent. Right. Yep. And we can move on to Harrison Radiator. Okay. The Harrison Radiator Corporation factory located in Lockport is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of industry for its leadership role in the design and production of heating and cooling components, primarily for the automotive industry, but over time for other industries as well. It is also significant under Criterion C as a significant example of a reinforced concrete daylight factory designed by Rochester architect James R. Tyler in an effort to improve efficiency and increase production. The period of significance begins with the earliest extant building constructed by the Harrison Radiator Company in 1917. The Harrison Radiator Corporation, later Delphi Corporation, utilized the factory until 1995 when production was transferred to a newer plant in West Lockport. The period of significance ends with the 50-year cutoff point of 1971. Next slide, please. Founded in 1910 by Herbert Champion Harrison, the company grew at an astounding rate. The company produced the Harrison Hexagon Radiator for automobiles, a radiator that Harrison had invented and patented. In the early years of automobile manufacturing, motors tended to overheat, making consumers hesitant to purchase cars. Harrison's honeycomb radiator increased the popularity of automobiles by reducing overheating and leaking. World War II challenged the company to expand operations of its technologies, earning the company a three star Army Navy E award. During World War II, Harrison Radiator produced heat exchangers, oil coolers, water coolers, intercoolers, superchargers, radiators, and thermostats for the manufacturing of planes, tanks, and gun carriages, which supplied allied countries fighting the war. As the NASA space program developed and grew in the 1960s, Harrison Radiator contributed to the development of spacesuit technology. Next slide. The Harrison Radiator Corporation factory is a large historic reinforced concrete daylight factory located near downtown Lockport. The factory complex consists of two contributing buildings. The first is a large internally connected set of components at the east of the site known as Building 1, 1A, 2, and Building 3. A second smaller component, Building 4, is located to the west along Walnut Street and is linked to the larger factory components by a long raised skyway. There are also two contributing water towers, two structures, one atop Building 3 and one freestanding located between Buildings 2 and 3. The complex was built in several stages and large completed between 1917 and 1930, with additions continuing into the 50s. By 1934, it was the largest manufacturing plant in the world, making heat transfer products for automobiles. It was also Lockport's largest employer, a status it retains today, although under a different name and in a different location. Next slide. Like the company, the Harrison Radiator Corporation facility grew in size, adapting to the increases in production and products. 
The factory was designed by Rochester architect James R. Tyler and constructed by the contracting firm of American Concrete Steel Company from Newark, New Jersey. The architect designed a modern reinforced concrete daylight factory, which was considered fire resistant, flexible, and efficient, while providing ample daylight to filter into the workspace. Load bearing columns made structural walls unnecessary, allowing an open and flexible plan. So it's a very difficult complex to photograph because it's very large. Um, here's some exterior views of the building. Uh, next slide. And it, then this is sort of the back side of the building uh, near the parking areas showing some of the, um, the water tower features. Uh, next slide. The downtown Lockport facility closed in 1987 and all operations moved to the new Upper Mountain Road plant in West Lockport, known as the West plant, which in 1995 became the Delphi Harrison Thermal Systems. By, by 2012, th 30 small businesses were operating in the former downtown plant. There are currently many tenants throughout the complex, including Trek Inc., an electronics in instruments manufacturer, the Challenger Learning Center, a private space education center, a farmer's market, a manufacturer of produce sorting and bagging equipment, a coffee roaster, and others. Building three remains almost entirely empty as the focus of the current rehabilitation plan. So I do believe that we have the consultant and the preparer of the nomination, Carolyn Coppola of Coppola Associates on the phone. Uh, Carolyn, did you want to add anything additional to this? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to echo some of the story that Jennifer so eloquently and succinctly summarized and add a little bit of my own experience on this project. So the story of Harrison Radiator Corporation Factory begins in 1910 when Herbert Harrison patented the Her Harrison hexagon automobile radiator. That invention greatly contributed to the rise of the automotive industry, which in turn transformed the ways American, Americans lived. Harrison's immediate success necessitated company expansion and more efficient production processes. He met these needs by constructing the daylight factory complex that is still in use today in a configuration close to its original. The buildings between 1917 and 1930 have retained their relevance and their usefulness. Harrison Radiator employed talented engineers and designers throughout its history, keeping the company in the forefront of innovation and state-of-the-art technologies. It was able to evolve from producing automobile radiators, heaters, thermostats, heat exchangers, windshield defrosters, transmission oil coolers, among many other things, to producing turbo superchargers that allowed Army Air Corps bombers in World War II to fly higher and drop bombs with more accuracy, aiding in an Allied victory. After the war, the demands for cars increased, Americans ventured onto new roads and into new suburbs, and they also ventured into space. Harrison Radiator Factory Corporation was poised to design heat exchangers for astronaut spacesuits used in manned flight, uh, space flights in 1962, while still advancing the comfort and safety of automobiles. While these and many other achievements and accomplishments are remarkable, perhaps the greatest accomplishment is the impact the company had outside the factory walls and in its community. I felt that. I visited Lockport multiple times to research and document the factory complex. It seemed that everyone I met had a story to tell about the factory because they or a relative had worked there and they wanted to help tell the story. An employee at that time who has since retired met me at the local historical society to help me cull through uncatalogued documents. He went back to the historical society on his loan on his own, leaving notes for me for when I returned. Retirees shared photos and memories. A company engineer who had spent years documenting the company's history sent me sections of his unpublished book draft. People in nearby restaurants and stores expressed excitement and enthusiasm for the recognition a National Register listing would bestow on this beloved local landmark. I shared some historic photos with the people currently working at Harrison Place. They were delighted. I have promised them more. People with whom I have spoken are rallying behind this nomination out of the factory's distinctive history. I can only hope that the story in this nomination does justice to this company, its legacy, and its people. And I thank you for your consideration in the nomination. Thank you. That's great.
Doug, this is Daniel. I just, uh, Carolyn, uh, you do, you, you have such a, um, such an accomplished professional career in the mid Hudson Valley in and around Newburgh in particular. I was certainly quite intrigued to see you involved in this project uh, upstate. So congrats on that. Um, this project Thank you. is two blocks off Main Street uh, in Lockport uh, and three blocks from the Erie Canal and, uh, and the flight of five. So it's a, it's a very critical piece of infrastructure uh, and commercial property in Lockport. And I'm just thrilled to see the nomination here. Questions or comments from the board? This is Carol. Um, as a native Detroiter, and that's a city where there are a significant number of <laughs> industrial daylight factories, I heartily endorse the nomination of the commission <laughs> rating it to the New York State and National Registers. Thanks. Uh, this, uh, this is Wint. Uh, I think that uh, we ha aren't seeing it on the screen, but the historical industrial uh, f photography that was uh, submitted are just spectacular. I mean, they're worthy of publication in a book. Uh, on their own uh, to see just how industry functioned, uh, modern industry functioned in Lockport uh, in the early years of the last century. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, move its approval. I think Carol already did. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is this is Erica Krieger. I just think it's fascinating that you have a a company that started at a time when people were hesitant to buy cars. Think about that. A car that we all you wouldn't not have a car almost in this day and age all the way up to cooling systems for astronauts what a a march through time that is um and it happened all here in in buffalo lockport lockport uh -huh. <laughs> no, well, north, of, north of the Tappancy bridge <laughs> <laughs> for those of us down here i and and i certainly will vote to approve well these right. these comments um make me want to ask uh was there ever any consideration of more of a national or or statewide significance to this nomination that's a good question doug i don't know that we really explored that um because certainly it would take a a broader review of other radiator companies other you know manufacturers across the state across the country um which we just didn't really pursue uh for for the this particular project um you know we we can explore that um but we can as we've discussed before we can always expand uh significance you know to a, an existing nomination down the road if you know additional research is undertaken um you know we can certainly edit a, a nomination once it's listed um, by National Park Service too, so. Yeah, understood. I think this is right for that. I mean, a, a building that takes us from before cars are popular to <laughs> outer space is uh, more than local significance in my mind. Um, okay. and, and the fact that, e the fact also that even as where it has gone beyond that and now just has multiple tenants, one of the tenants is a challenger learning center. How great is that? Yes, indeed. Excellent. Okay, so um, any other comments? And can I give Carol the, the, the motion to approve? Yes, yes. And, and the second? Uh, you got it from Erica if there's no one else. What wonderful. Uh, any objections or abstentions? There being none, this is approved by unanimous consent and we can move on to the John Cam Malt House. Great. Great. The John Cam the John Cam Company Malt House and Kiln House was constructed in 1901 in the city of Buffalo's Black Rock neighborhood for the John Cam Malting Company. The building was designed by John F. Dornfeld, the engineer who also patented the innovative pneumatic drum germinating system and pneumatic kiln technologies utilized at the site. With its large German and Polish communities, malting and brewing were significant industries in Buffalo during the 19th and early 20th century, as we've seen through several other projects. Next slide. John Cam, who was considered 
quote, one of the pioneers of the malting industry in Buffalo, end quote, was born in Bavaria in 1833, where he trained as a brewer and maltster. He emigrated to Buffalo in 1855 and worked as the brewmaster for the Jacob Shoe Malting Company at Genesee and Spring Streets. In 1860, he started his own bakery, which he ran until 1869 when he started a small malt house adjacent to the bakery. With the success of the malting business, he constructed a building at Genesee and Pratt Streets in 1872, which he enlarged in 1879 and again in 1884. In 1889, he founded the John Cam Malting Company with his sons. In 1898, it was, quote, one of the largest privately owned commercial enterprises in Buffalo, end quote, with a capacity of 600,000 bushels annually. To meet the demand for malt, the company constructed a large malt house on Hurdle Avenue in 1901, operating the two facilities at the same time. At the time of its construction, the John Cam Malting Company facility on Hurdle Avenue was the largest pneumatic drum malting system in Buffalo and boastfully claimed to be the biggest malt house on earth. The capacity of the new malt house had increased dramatically to 2 million bushels annually. Following John Cam's death in 1905, his sons continued operation of the company, utilizing both the Genesee and Pratt complex, uh, where the compartment, compartment system of malting was used, and the facility on Hurdle Avenue where the pneumatic drum and kiln system was used. The John Cam Company continued to thrive, and the business was one of the largest malting enterprises in the city of Buffalo and allegedly throughout the country. In late 1918, the Oswego Milling Company purchased the John Cam Malting Company plant on Hurdle Avenue. The John Cam Malting Company complex was sold at a time when increasing government restrictions on the malting industry and World War I conditions had strained the business. At this time, the new company, at, at this time, a new company, the Black Rock Milling Company, was formed. Joseph Cam became treasurer of the new company, continuing the site's association with the Cam family briefly into the 1920s. Dornfeld's kiln house remained and was used in the production of powdered feed. The Black Rock Milling Company's conversion of the building from a malt house to a grain feed mill was celebrated in trade journals as, quote, a shining example of how old and discarded plants may be put to practical use, end quote, making it an early example of an adaptive reuse project by two different types of businesses affiliated with the grain industry. At this time, Dornfeld's pneumatic germination drums were removed from the building and shipped to South American and Mexican firms. The Black Rock Milling Company continued to expand the facilities, constructing several small one story brick and steel warehouses and sheds that are not existing for their growing operations from, from 1920 into the late 1950s until they sold the complex to the Buffalo Insulation Company in 1961. The steel silos and elevators, which were used to move and store the barley, were demolished after the Buffalo Insulation Company purchased the building. In 1962, the one-story concrete block loading dock addition was added on the east elevation. Next slide. While the nomination does an excellent job in describing the malt making process, I just wanted to help illustrate the basics of the process a bit further uh, using historic images here and, and the maps. So here, here we're just kind of highlighting from that histo previous historic image some of the basic components of the facility um, at the time the CAMs were using it. Next slide. So here we're going to walk through uh, the process of malting. The first step in the process is that barley would have arrived via a private rail spur from the adjacent Beltline Railroad at the west. The barley would have been unloaded by the cam company via the attached grain elevator, which is highlighted in blue. Next slide. From there, the grain would have been stored in the large storage silos at the north end of the facility where it would await processing. Next slide. The barley would then be moved to the malting house where it would be steeped to allow for germination. While floor malting was common here, the cam malt house utilized the pneumatic drum system developed by Dornfeld. The building once housed 42 drums on the first floor and 21 steeping vats on the second. Barley would be steeped in the vats above the drums where each vat would feed two drums below. The vats sat within openings in the concrete with pipes connected to the drums below. The steeped barley would then enter the drums which rotated to provide aeration. Next slide. The final step in the malt making process was for the germinated barley to be dried in the kiln. Here the grain would have been spread on perforated metal floors with heated, heated by furnaces underneath. Air would have been drawn through the floors by massive rooftop fans and cupolas which are visible in the historic drawings. The finished malt would have lightly been stored in the silos or shipped and shipped out on the rail line. Next slide. 
Extensive images are included in the draft provided to the board, but just as a refresher, here are views showing the current exterior of the building. Next slide. And some views of the interior. The two in images of the left show areas of the malting house, while the two images of the right show the kiln house, perforated drying floors at the top, and the air mixing chamber between the kiln and the drying floors below. Next slide. Well, the nomination goes, does a good job in providing ample information and the John Cam Malting Company undoubtedly was significant. The question before the board today is whether the building retains sufficient physical integrity to convey the significance. Here I've circled the components that are missing today. We've, we're missing the rooftop cupolas that help house those fans, also the silos, the head house above the silos and the elevator. Next slide. While the elevator and silos were not part of the malt making process, they were part of the fundamental function of the facility, and malt could not have been made without loading and storing the barley. Dornfeld's innovative pneumatic drum system is also gone. So the question is, are all four parts of the building necessary to convey the historic significance of what took place here? I do want to note that we've just received uh, letters of support from New York State Assembly Member William C. Conrad, Council Member Joseph Golombek Jr., Michael David, President of the American Malting and Barley Association, and Ethan Cox, local Buffalo author and brewery historian. So now I'm going to turn things over to the consultant on the project, Carrie Trainer, who's going to make a brief presentation. Carrie, you ready? Yep. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, well, Jennifer did a great job explaining. Uh, the malt house and the kiln house and, and briefly the process. Um, what, what she didn't explain was the significance associated with Dornfeld. John Dornfeld and John Cam were pioneers in the malting industry. Dornfeld's patents defined the technology used throughout the United States. It is at the Cam malt house where his patents and architects realized for the first time in a design specific by Dornfeld to house these technologies. The, produce, the production of malt. Next slide, please. The building was designed in the Runbogenstil style. This is a German style that's used in brewery architecture. It functionally accommodated the programmatic requirements of brewing and malting in a style that reflects the German heritage. Criterion C. I'm actually going to talk about criterion A. Malting is the process of preparing the grain, commonly barley, for the use in the production of wort. As described in the 1901 American Handy Book of the Brewing, Malting, and Auxiliary Trades, and I quote, it broadly, it embraces every manipulation from the moment the crude grain leaves the elevator or storehouse. In a more confined sense, the term is sometimes applied only to the three operations of steeping, germination, and kiln drying. At, next slide, please. At the Cam Malt House and Kiln House, where the grain, when the grain entered the building, it did not leave until it was converted into malt. It did not go back into the silos. Um, that would have been a mix of the two products that didn't happen. All three operations, steeping, germination, and kiln drying occurred within the building that you see on this slide. We argue that this building retains a high level of integrity for an understanding of the cutting edge technologies associated with John Dornfeld's patents. This building was designed specifically to house. Next slide, please. It's significant for its contribution to industrial history and cutting edge patented technologies. Designed by John F. Dornfeld and implemented for the first time at the Cam Malt House and Kiln House in 1901, the same time his newly formed company was formed. Remember, Dornfeld was considered a pioneer in the development of these technologies. Next slide. It should be noted, as I will illustrate, 
the building's plan, volumes, and form are dependent upon the technologies patented by and implemented at this building. Further, the John Cam Company Malthouse and Kiln House is a rare example of Dornfeld's subtype and technologies. It is the first example in Buffalo and is one of the earliest examples, if not the first in the country, designed by Dornfeld to specifically house his patented technologies. I will briefly in a few minutes talk about the other subtype, uh, which is the compartment system. Next slide, please. The volumetric spaces and column grid associated with the two-story malt house are a direct reflection of Dornfeld's drum malting system. As Jennifer mentioned, there were 42 drums on the first floor. These were put in place in the winter, and then the building was constructed around them. The volume and form determined by the number and arrangement of the drums is reflected in the architecture of the malt house. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Although the drums and steeple vats are no longer extent, collar beams in the ceiling of the first floor and rings in the concrete on the second floor mark the location of and interaction between the vats and drums. In the basement, the green malt was transported horizontally and then vertically in conveyors at the west of the building. The vertical conveyors remain extant as illustrated by photographs on page 64 of the nomination. Next slide, please. The interior of the kiln house is functionally derived with the architecture intrinsically part of the pneumatic kiln process described, patented and designed by Dornfeld. The design of the kiln house is related directly to the kilning apparatus it houses. The equipment forms the internal architectural composition as a comparison of Dornfeld's section to the left and a section of the existing building to the right illustrated. Next slide, please. The turning apparatus patented by Dornfeld is visible in the building and remains extant. Next slide, please. The turning apparatus, again, the patent and a picture illustrating this apparatus remain in the building. Next slide, please. As does the malt stirrer. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The kiln turners, as I just showed you. Oh, go back one, please. The kiln turners, as I just showed you, and the kiln floors remain extant in this building. They are machines that form the architecture. These are Dornfeld's patented technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. As does the kiln conveyor. The patent illustrated in the left, the image of it extent in the building, and the image on the right illustrates the horizontal conveyor at the upper floor where the green wall would have been transported from the basement to this level and then dropped on the drying floors below during the process. Next slide, please. The air mixing chamber and associated hoppers further illustrate the integral relationship between Dornfeld's patented technologies and the architecture used in the production of malt. Next slide, please. The comparison of the two subtypes, they both have specific spatial requirements, which result in different architectural volumes and plans. The compartment system is based on the work of engineer designer Saladin and the drum on Dornfeld. To truly understand the significance of the John Cam Malt House and Kiln House, it is necessary to understand the architectural requirements of the Dornfeld system that distinguishes this subtype from the Saladin box system. It is not just a matter of the type of equipment inside. The choice of mal the malting process directly determines the interior volumes, plan, and form of the malt house architecture itself. While the compartment system requires a rectangular room, with a large open space for inserting the germinating boxes. 
The Dornfeld drum system requires a space that is specifically designed to accommodate the cylindrical forms of the drums. Even if the drums are later removed, the presence of the curved forms at the first floor ceiling and second floor provide architecturally specific evidence of the Dornfeld drum system subtype. Further, the building's form and volume clearly indicates its function specifically as they relate to the rare remaining Dornfeld system. Again, this was the first subtype in Buffalo, probably the country, and it's the only remaining of this subtype using Dornfeld's patented technologies in Buffalo. Next slide, please. Um, to, to, it is a rare example. So there are six malt houses remaining in Buffalo. The National Register listed Schaefer and Brothers Malt House um, is pre-Dornfeld. Uh, the Kreiner Malt House, it's uh, a Saladin uh, box system subtype, also a completely different architectural form, um, and the Pro Malt House, uh, which was also the Saladin box system. The remaining two, other than Dorn, other than Cam, um, have suffered greatly from deterioration, do not retain any of their original equipment, and were not designed to employ the Dornfeld system. Next slide, please. A comparison of integrity, and, and I'd like to uh, illustrate this using the National Register listed Siegel Phoenix Brewery, designed by Otto C. Wolf. It is significant for its association with refrigeration house technology um, and the uh, Ron Vogan still style. Next slide, please. I draw your attention to this portion. Uh, it is the um, brew house and the malt house and uh, elevators. Now, while the malt house and elevators were never constructed, next slide, please. As this historic image illustrates, a single story um, copper shop and barrel storage building and the brew house were constructed. Next slide, please. So this portion here, the refrigeration house and brew house and the single story barrel storage and copper shop portion of the building. One might argue that these are essential components to the production of lager as the refrigeration house is an essential component to the production of lager. Next slide, please. However, the brew house and single storage barrel, are, and the single story barrel storage and copper shop buildings are no longer extant. The brew house, barrel storage, and copper shop, again, are essential to the Ziegel Brewery. However, this loss, was not considered a sufficient loss of integrity to prevent the building from being listed on the National Register. Next slide, please. Further, the barrels on the interior, the storage component, and the refrigeration process are no longer extant. Only the interior volume where they were located remains and remains at the time of listing. Despite the loss of the brew house, copper shop, and barrel storage buildings, specifically that highly ornate parapeted brew house, the Ziegel Phoenix Refrigeration House and Office was listed on the National Register on January 24, 2018, for its contribution to an understanding of refrigeration technology in the production of lager. Next slide, please. And yes, as Jennifer pointed out, we do have the, uh, the metal silos and the elevator. Next slide, please. They are no longer extant. Next slide, please. The CAM property, however, retains the essential components associated with the production of malt that embodied Dornfeld's innovative patented technology. This storage component is no longer extant, but as period publications note, the and I quote, the machinery used in the transfer of grain in the storage elevators 
was considered to be practically the same in construction and operation, again, I'm quoting here, and were merely apparatus for the handling of materials. It was the development in pneumatic technology and the steeping, germinating, and kilning apparatus that were considered significant. Again, as the American Handy Book of Brewing points out in 1901, malting is the process of preparing the grain, commonly barley, for use in the production of beer wort. Broadly, it embraces every manipulation from the moment the crude grain leaves the elevator or storehouse. In a more confined sense, the term is sometimes applied only to the operations of steeping, germination, and kiln drying. The entire malting process occurred within the extant malt house and kiln house, which retained the apparatus designed and patented by John Dornfeld. Next slide, please. Dornfeld's patented technologies remain extant. The design of the kiln house, the, the uh, apparatus that remains, the collar beams in the ceiling, the indexing on the floor, the significance of this resource is not about the storage of barley. It is about the innovative technologies it houses and the architecture and form that result because of these technologies as a Dornfeld pneumatic malt house and kiln house. It is a rare example of this subtype and technologies. It's the first example in Buffalo, one of the earliest examples, if not the first in the country, and the only remaining of this subtype in Buffalo. Next slide, please. And so the question um, that Jennifer asked as well, how much is enough to illustrate significant aspects of the past, of the industrial past? We argue that sufficient historic fabric remains to allow for an understanding of these technologies, similar to the historic fabric that remains at the National Register listed Phoenix Brewery. I appreciate your time um, allowing me to speak to this topic and uh, your consideration of this nomination. Thank you, Carrie. That was a very compelling presentation. And thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Doug? Yes, Hi, this is, Gen this is Jennifer. I just want to clarify one point of information for the board, um, many of whom reviewed some of the projects that Carrie has shown. Um, just to be clear, we did not list the Phoenix Brewery. Uh, we listed the Phoenix facility as a warehouse and office because of the loss of the brewery and the fact that malting facility was never constructed. So the, the, we actually did not list the Phoenix Brewery. We listed the Phoenix Brewery warehouse and office just to be just to provide some clarification if there was some confusion for the board mm -hmm. okay Thank so, you. yep all right so the board has received uh, the letter from the Department of the Interior and the timeline memo from parks uh, does somebody else want to speak and introduce this uh, discussion yes this is Fred Lafaso I'm the sponsor of the project and um, I guess I wanted to convey to the to the board, I've been in, in the real estate business 35 years and I've gone through a lot of historical buildings. And when I first walked into this building, um, it was plain as day as uh, what this building was built for and what the use was. It was like walking into a museum. Um, one of the things that was not part of the MPS original submission because we were unaware of it at the time that it was existed in the building because it was covered up was the, those malt turning machines, uh, which were, they're, they're absolutely, they're beautiful. Um, they traveled 150 feet, 30 feet long and, um, and, you know, they would go over these dumping floors and uh, just beautiful pieces of machinery that still exist in the building. Um, it, again, so there was really no question in my mind what this building was used for. I've never been through a building um, quite like that, that, you know, and I've been through the Schaefer and I've been through a lot of other historical buildings in Buffalo. You knew right away what this building was used for. You know, I guess to speak to the extent of the loss of the silos, um, 
I mean, you can see on the on the rear elevation, then the north side of the of the building, where the silos were. Um, I think it would. But yep, that's the south side, so it would be on the north side. Uh, if you have a yeah, along the north, you could see the discoloration in the brick where the silos were, um, which I think means a lot. You know, it's indicated you know on the building uh, where the silos were, which um, uh, it, which is which is huge. So the um, the building itself has towered over Black Rock for 121 years. Um, it's the tallest building in in Black Rock. Uh, it means a lot to the community, um, the the local people of Black Rock, to see this building um, repurposed. Um, it means a lot to the uh, the people of Buffalo uh, to see this building repurposed. You know, you know, although we did lose the the silos, which were not even designed by John F. Dornfeld, um, we don't want to lose this the remaining structure, and I, I think it's just an important asset, you know, to the community. Well, and thanks I, for that. No, you're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. I have, I have a follow up question for you. Was the National Register form updated since the National Park Service saw it uh, for the board's review? Or, and are you suggesting that information about that uh, discovery yes. could be added to the form or is it already in there? No, it, Doug, if I can speak, um, yes, we uh, received the letter um, from Roger Reed, and there were uh, some comments in his uh, denial for the part one um, because he didn't have the information. So in his denial, he said, and I quote, um, that he, the, the state of the staff, the New York State Historic Preservation Office questioned the listing due to the loss of the character finding integral features of the malt house. Um, he didn't see all of that patented equipment. Uh, and he actually even said that um, that given the removal of all, and I'm quoting from the letter, all the pneumatic equipment for which he is claimed to be significant. And clearly, as my presentation showed, um, if it's not there, it's indexed by the presence of the collar beams and the marks on the floor. So there is information um, that his comments are directly uh, illustrated to be um, not having a complete story. Okay, that's important. Um, Doug, this is Jay. I, I had a question. I, I was wondering, so, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, um, but um, if if someone were to, were to walk into this building and have a basic knowledge of malting and these historical processes, uh, it, it is, are you making the case that this could be read as uh, as using the Dornfield Dornfeld process because of the the equipment that remains plus your ability to read where the lost equipment existed? So, in other words, you, you're saying that someone could walk in there and say, "Oh, this is a this is a this is a Dornfeld plan." Yes, exactly. It, it requires a nuanced understanding of the differences between a Dornfeld and Saladin system. You, you have to you have to understand malting, but definitely this section section shows that um, again, Dornfeld on the left, our building on the right, uh, is it's there. Uh, it, you, you would have to have someone narrate it if you didn't know anything about malting. But yes, it's indexed where the drums were. Again, the drums were put in place in the winter and then the building designed around it. It wasn't, let's build a building and stick some drums in it. So, so yes, the drums are gone, but there's enough indexing that we have the presence of the absence. So yeah, you would know it's a Dornfeld system. It's completely different than Saladin. And the argument here is that it's not, you, you're, you're not saying it's significant just as a generic malt house. You're saying it's significant because it reflects this process and, yes. this, and these patented technologies, which then you're, you are still able to read, in your opinion, in this building. Exactly. Um, it's Dornfeld, Dornfeld. There were, there were two 
the, the nomination describes it in detail, the history, but Dornfeld and Saladin had these two different ways of germinating, um, two different ways of, of moving the, the green mold uh, to get it wilted to become actual mold. And this building is purely a Dornfeld example. And it's completely different. If you looked at my comps um, and you look at the, uh, if, you, if you go to the comp page real quick, those, those are the three other malt houses that remain, and they're completely different. They're completely different in their organization. They're completely different in their design because their systems of malting were completely different. Again, we, okay. as Jennifer said, the, the Phoenix was about the, the refrigeration house. Yeah, I agree. Um, we're making the same argument. This is about malting, Dornfeld malting, not Saladin. The Dornfeld pneumatic subtype. And I think the point that was already made is 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 a is a is an interesting one that the Park Service didn't seem to have the full picture, which is I guess what what you're saying, right? Exactly. Again, the Park Service put a lot of weight into the um, the silos and the elevator that are no longer extent without truly understanding the significance of Dornfeld and then even stating in their, their denial letter. And again, I am reading. As noted in Shippo's preliminary review of the draft nomination, this focus on Dornfeld's innovat innovations is problematic given the removal of all pneumatic equipment for which he is claimed to be significant. And as I've shown, uh, it's all there. It's not missing. Uh, this right. is Krifton. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Jay, are you still going? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, right, with the exception of the pneumatic tanks and the, and the, uh, but, but with the drums, but we understand that those are readable in the architecture. Yes. Okay. Kristen, please. Thank you. I wanted to keep going on where, where Jay was here and, um, so forgive me, I think I have a question and some comments. So we were provided uh, yesterday, a sort of video um, montage of, of the images. Um, and I noted that this video includes information that is not in the nomination. And I wanted to push that a little further too, because to me, if it is accurate information, it supports your Dornfield case. And so for one thing, the video implies that Dornfield had, or maybe it doesn't imply it states, 50 different patents. And so I wanted to verify, are there 50 patents related to this process? And can you specifically state how many of them were in use in this building and how many are extant? Meaning that much is made of the missing pneumatic drums, but as you've made the case, there are other examples of the, his patented technology. So. How many of his patents are in this building? And of those, how many are extant? Do so, have that information? Yes, I can, I can speak to that. So yes, um, Dornfeld didn't stop after this building was constructed in 1901. So as of night, so what happened was Dornfeld was working for as, as an engineer and he, he left that, he formed his own company in 1901. And when he formed his own company, he took the patent that he owned and put the patents to date, 1901, in this building. So the, the uh, pneumatic malting kiln house and the uh, germination using the drums. Now, the other patents, he didn't stop. So he kept designing uh, patents. And, and those 50 patents keep going. So he had patents in like, you know, 1905, 1907, 1915. Um, but this building is this point in time where here Dornfeld is on his own with his newly formed company, and he builds this and designs this and puts all of these patents. So you're looking at it. Everything that is there is his patented technologies. As I said, the, the, he didn't design the silos. He didn't design the elevator. That stuff was commonplace. And as I quoted, practically the same in every malt house. But it's these systems that are significant. So, Carrie, what I'm wondering is, 
like for me as a reader, um, if there were a sentence or two, to, to me, if there was this context of, um, and to me, it's almost just a couple sentences that uh, this building, as you described, includes multiple patents of Dornfield. Some of them exist, some of them do not. Again, as I read the criticism from the Park Service, I took it to mean, because I read it first before I read the nomination intentionally, and I took it to mean that the, the comments from there were, well, none of these patents exist anymore, and that's not the case. So am I making sense? Like, for me, I almost need, like, um, a, 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 like you framed it really well, I thought, in this presentation of, like, Here's a patent. Here it is. Here's the patent. Here it is. Here's a patent. Here's the ghost lines of it. Like it provides to me more evidence that Dornfeld's fingerprints are all over the remains of these buildings. Whereas I took the criticism from the Park Service's read of the version they saw as not um, having that in the forefront. That's, that's that, that may I be agree. a mystery, but that's my that's my suggestion is that this is your case. The case is Dornfeld indeed, not the full function of this building. And that, you know, I'm buying into that it's there physically. Um, and that maybe it just needs a little massaging to strengthen. Do you do thoughts on that? Um yes, I mean <laughs> everything that's remaining in this building is a Dornfeld design. Um, the patents that we show are the ones that, you know, how much time do we have to present? And I mean, I'm already taking a awful lot of your time. Um, but I agree, we can we can provide a list and, and a, an index at the back of this nomination to show his patents and what exists here and why he was important. Um, by 1920, the Saladin system became more popular. Um, so he, his, his system began to fall out of uh, popularity by about the 1920s. Got it. I, d I think, um, I just think that documentation, that framing could really help, at least, at least again, my read, to, to see, um, to, to see what you're presenting here, how how much of this building is re how much of the Dornfield story is retained. So I'm just suggesting that that, that could be really helpful. It seems to me in yeah. someone reading this. I agree, and we will do that. I, I so just, I'm sorry. This is Carol Clark, and I'm um, you know, I agree completely with Kristen. I think that this uh, nomination needs to be overhauled, and this information needs to be not just you know, in a, in a succinct way added in, but really highlighted in, if this argument is central and then this could be reconsidered, it would seem to me, but not until and, and uh, unless there is a very substantive revision of the nomination itself. Other questions and comments from the board? Wait, this is Kristen. Carol, um, do you, so I'm, I'm wondering whether it can be done with a, Less of it. So you think it needs a major overhaul, or could the case be made with just some massage? My feeling is that it needs a major overhaul if that's okay. the central argument. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is this is Jay. I guess I guess um I guess I'm I mean I hear what Carol's saying. I think I'm more in the Kristen camp in the sense that um if there is such a thing, that um that I, I, I think I did get that from the nomination. I think maybe what might have muddied it was the the parks, the the park service letter. Um, you know, almost because it, it, you know, reading this and looking at the, you know, look the 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 nomination makes the case that the pneumatic drums are indexed in there. The steeping tanks are are indexed in there. The kiln floor and the stirrers are patented and they actually are extant. The the elevator, the internal movements, the buckets and things to get the barley up to the, you know, up to the um, or green up to the top of the kiln floor is there. So it, it kind of I think it was. I think it's in there. I think maybe it's 
maybe just hammering home what the significance is that it that it's it's not just for a generic malt house it's for this specific process and um i don't know i i i think i got that now um but may, maybe it would require a little bit more re reworking um i don't know chairman is there a way that we can i mean what what, what do you want to do do you do you want to say move it move it saying that we are going to um that we would um want these changes made or is the sense that we should send her send it back for an entire rewriting okay i'm not sure procedurally what the way to go is but if you formulated your motion in such a way as to accommodate additional information being added to the form i think that would be acceptable I think I would make that motion to, um, I think I would make the motion to approve this nomination uh, with, um, with uh, a, some, 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 with some slight additions that make it clear that it's being nominated because of the significance of the Dornfeld process and that there is a significant amount of that still extant in the building either there or it can be read in the building itself understood um doug um this is kath frank may i just make a clarification here sure um all of that information about um what is extant in the building it it may not have been as developed as the nomination that you saw but it was in the original nomination and to just interpret Roger's letter, um, he specifically focused on the fact that he felt all the parts, including the silos and elevator, were necessary to illustrate um, the, the brewing process. He gave um, her another, or, sorry, he gave Carrie another option for pursuing listing, which is to, to develop the architectural significance of the building as an example of Romanesque revival style architecture. He felt that was a path to nomination and that wasn't um, changed in the in the revised nomination. So that was a path that we thought might have some possibilities. Um, so just if you're going to ask for revisions, um, he did actually in, in the first nomination, it was not as complete as this one, but it did have all of the things about the tubes and um, the location of the vats and um, the kiln. Um, and I also want to ask Carrie one question while I have the floor briefly. Um, was this kiln uh, dramatically different from the kilns used in the other, the box system and all that? Did that reflect the pneumatic system? Um, and, you know, how much of that was, because the kiln is very intact. So those are my two, one clarification and one question. Thank you. The um, the kiln, if you is is Dornfeld's design completely. That is his uh, patent, um, and those pieces that are in there, as I showed you, uh, it's it's a completely different design from Saladin, and that's the point. The, the box system, and and actually, I think I've got a picture that actually shows. So these are his kiln turners, his kiln floor. Um, if you go to the image of the box system, and I don't remember what slide it's on, it's where I showed the subtypes. So it might be a little bit further. Again, here. So you can see. No, go back one. You can see that the compartment type at the top is completely different in its architecture uh, because it didn't have to accommodate the same volume. Now with the kiln house, it's 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 different than it's Dornfeld's patents. Other people may use them, but this is Dornfeld's patented system used for the first time by Dornfeld in this building. Thanks, Carrie. Now I understand that. Could I just make one comment? This is Fred LaFasso. The equipment was not discovered, the floor turning machine and the conveyor, um, until I think it was in mid-January. And that's why it wasn't part of the original nomination. And I have to say, when I found it, I was totally blown away by it. 
Uh, that, I just wanted, I guess, to clarify that. Any okay, other um, questions from other board members? No, I just, uh, this is Kathy Howe. I just wanted to um, interject for a moment and go back to Jay's sort of comment or question um, on whether or not, you know, if the board felt, you know, and wanted to move this forward, there is certainly, we have done this in the past, there is precedent for moving something forward and taking a vote, you know, with sort of some of the condition that, you know, certain revisions are made to the nomination. I can think of one, in fact, that I had worked on years ago, a rope works uh, factory in Brooklyn where the, the board moved with um, revisions that were made subsequent to the um, approval. So. Mm -hmm. wanted to answer that question for clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from the state review board? All right, I think we have a motion on the table to approve with revisions. Jay, do I have that correct? So moved. Do I have a second? This is Kristen, yes, I would second that. All right, now I'm going to ask for objections and abstentions to that motion from the rest of the board. There being none, this is approved by unanimous consent with the stipulation that this form be revised to reflect the specificity that was presented uh, today uh, and, and is not included in the form. Is that, is, that a, is that an okay way to say that? Does everybody understand what we've accomplished here? Yep. Yes. Yes. Very so good. We agree. This is Daniel. Uh, Kathy and I agree that that's sufficient. Yeah. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, really lively conversation and, and uh, a lot of learning just occurred about malting and uh, who's not thirsty. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Mo moving on to uh, James Finelli and the Montville Cemetery. Thank you. Uh, so this is the Montville Cemetery. It's located on Jordan Road in the hamlet of Montville, which is within the town of Skinny Atlas in Onondaga County. The cemetery occupies about one acre of land bounded on the east side by a metal fence. There's a total of 411 burials on record with some relocated interments, which predate the cemetery. Stones are largely arrayed in, arranged in rows with the inscriptions facing either east toward the entry or west away from the entry. Founded in 1819, Montville Cemetery meets criterion A in the area of exploration and settlement as a pioneer era burial ground that provides information about the earliest citizens of the area. The cemetery includes several, several Revolutionary War veterans who served in New England, New York, and Nova Scotia. The cemetery also meets criterion C in the area of art for its collection of funerary monuments ranging from the early 19th century to the early 20th century. Next slide, please. The earliest stones are of the tablet form with, with either flat lobed or arched heads. Uh, if you look at the upper right photo, those are, those are some of the very earliest ones, some of those that were relocated. Most of these are marble and exhibit neoclassical motifs, such as urns, willow, trees, and fan patterns. By the mid 19th century period, observable changes included the rendering of the inscriptions in raised lettering against a low relief background with corresponding molded border. Some stones of this type feature decorative embellishments above this recessed panel. The Mottville Cemetery also contains stone obelisks. These typically arise from a multi-part base and are notable for the relative height in comparison with other markers. You see those in the lower right. Also dating from this period are pedestal monuments, some terminated with curved, uh, carved urns. Next slide, please. You see an example of that in the, in the center photo. Stones of the later 19th, 19th and early 20th centuries are frequently larger and blocker markers executed in polished stone, often granite, giving them an austere appearance. Stones with martial and patriotic motifs, such as flags and shields, appear during this period on markers of war veterans. Next slide, please. Now, there are a number of uh, Revolutionary War veterans who lived in, in a diversity of places before coming 
uh, to Skinny Atlas, but I, I wanted to touch on a couple of them here. Um, you'll see on the right here, uh, the cemetery uh, contains the burials of several early members of the Earl family. Daniel Earl Sr. was born in 1729 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. His family later moved to Nova Scotia. Sometime after 1770, he moved to Maine, then part of Massachusetts, then back to Massachusetts where he lived in Brookline. In 1778, he enlisted for a term of nine months in the Massachusetts line of the Continental Army, where he saw service in the Hudson Valley. He eventually moved to Whitehall, New York, and then to Onondaga Valley in 1792. Leaving Onondaga Valley, he came to Skinny Atlas in 1810 to live with his sons. He died in March of 1817 at the age of 88 and was relocated from an earlier burial site nearby. Uh, another early uh, settler, and this is on the left here, um, in the Montville Cemetery is Thomas Waite. Waite lived in Vermont before coming to Skinny Atlas. During the revolution, Waite served a couple of short terms as a corporal with Colonel Ira Allen's regiment of militia in 1780 and 1781. It appears that Thomas may have also served in Massachusetts before moving to Vermont. After the revolution, he moved to Granville, New York, before finally settling in Skinny Atlas. Uh, Thomas and his wife, Naomi, share a headstone. The Cemetery remains an important historic resource that chronicles the settlement of the Montville area and portrays shifting tastes in gravestone design in central New York. This nomination was sponsored by the town of Skinny Atlas and the Skinny Atlas Town History. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, nicely presented. Questions or comments about Montville Cemetery from the State Review Board? Is the yellow ribbon in the image we see right now on the right significant? Yeah, the um, the cemetery had um, uh, in like the mid 20th century had suffered some deterioration in more recent years. The Cemetery Association has been very active in doing restoration work. And so I believe that the little ribbons are for ones that we need to be kept an eye on. Excellent. And the, the criterion C is not for the landscape. It's just for the funerary art of the headstones themselves. Correct. Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it is a, a very simple rural burial ground. And so, um, the focus is really on the headstones and, you know, this is just a small selection, but there, there are very fine examples of neoclassical designs throughout the cemetery. Excellent. Uh, uh, I'd just like to add to you, uh, I'm president of Oakwood Cemetery in Troy, and when you see those yellow ribbons as a rule of thumb, uh, they are placed there, and then we will apply to the state uh, for uh, funds. There's so many dollars that go in on each burial and cremation that go into a fund, um, and each year we go through, we nominate uh, stones that are in danger, in serious condition of uh, you know, falling or whatever. And we've received remuneration to uh, restore them. And we've done probably several hundred uh, going through that. So it's something a lot of these cemeteries should be aware of, but there are funds out there to um, to provide support on those restoration. If it's, if it's monitored and the state will follow through to see that you've followed through with it. And usually we will hire a local um, monument person to come in to do that, but it's been very successful at Oakwood and I think Albany Rural is doing a lot of it now too. Great. Thank you, Tom. That's that's really nice to add. Doug, may we request uh, for the public, we certainly recognize the voices on staff, but if, if members of the board would identify themselves before providing comment, that would be helpful. Sure thing. That was Tom Maggs. That was Tom Maggs. Unmistakable. <laughs> I'd be happy to move this. And I'm sure Whit would have, Whit and I always like cemeteries. We find a lot of our friends there. <laughs> uh, any other questions? We have a motion. Do I hear a second? Well, I'll second it, certainly. Uh, anyone, uh, uh, any objections or abstentions to this, uh, to this motion? Uh, there being none, it's approved by unanimous consent. Thanks, James. Um, okay, we've been at this an hour and a half. Do people want to take a three minute break? Uh, since we're not going to have a lunch or any other breaks and we have a lot of these to do, or should we wait a bit?
Yeah, break is fine. Let's take five. Take five minutes. I have 1139 and we'll call the meeting back to order at 1141. So two minute warning. Okay, I have 1141. Uh, call the meeting back to order uh, and make sure that we still have our quorum. Uh, it's always dangerous to take a little break like that, but I, I think people appreciate that. Um, next up, we have Linda Mackey and uh, 240 Broadway, Brooklyn, New York. Okay, good morning. Um, the building at 240 Broadway is locally significant under criterion C 
in the area of architecture as a representative example of cast iron commercial architecture in Brooklyn. Designed by Theobald Engelhardt, for firm manufacturer Louis Ezekiel, it is the only known work by Engelhardt designed in the Italianate style and incorporating cast iron building technology. Cast iron architecture never achieved the same level of popularity in Brooklyn as it did in Manhattan during the 19th century. Not surprisingly, the majority of cast iron foundries were situated in Manhattan. Moreover, there are currently 250 cast iron buildings in Manhattan compared to only 20 in Brooklyn, less than half the nearly 50 that existed in 1886. As one of only 20 cast iron buildings that survive in Brooklyn, this is a rare and unusual survivor. The, build, the period of significance encompasses its design in 1891 to its completion in 1892. Next slide. Engelhardt's design for the building is distinguished by two prominent features, its intricate cast iron facade and its pentagonal footprint. Although the store entrances and storefront assembly are replacement units, the ground floor retains original features, such as its decorative end piers with foliate motifs. The second floor fenestration was altered around 1940 to accommodate a bowling alley. Finally, the unfortunate loss of its cornice and pedimented bulkhead occurred sometime after 1940 based on historic photos. Thus, despite this partial loss, 240 Broadway retains sufficient integrity to convey its significance as a fine example of cast iron architecture. The loss of the cornice and dormer are mitigated by the intricate design of the cast iron facade and its integrity documenting the art of this building material. Now on the right, you see the text photo from around 1940. Next slide. Although cast iron's popularity declined by the close of the 19th century, it was still considered a viable construction technology due to its low cost, strength, durability, paintable surfaces, and ease of production in creating a wide variety of architectural ornament. Further, it was also notable for its ease of assembly and parts replacement. These qualities would have made it an attractive alternative to Mason Reconstruction for Ezekiel, who not only operated a factory showroom in Manhattan's Soho neighborhood for many years prior to commissioning the nominated building, but also sought to attract factory owners and retailers to a speculative venture during a heightened period of growth along Broadway, Williamsburg's principal artery. Interior areas of both retail and factory spaces featured open floor plans with cast iron columns crowned with Corinthian capitals, wood floors, and sheets of decorative pressed metal ceiling tiles. Next slide. The earliest tenants included a clothing merchant and furniture, carpets, and bedding retailer, along with a neckwear manufacturer. By 1897, Ezekiel himself had relocated his fur factory into the nominated building, while his son William opened his shoemaking factory in the ground floor. Other tenants by the end of the 19th century included a tailor, engraver, and manufacturers of knee pants, undertaker supplies, upholstery goods, and a barber in the ground floor. The nominated building later has two long-term tenants that include a cafeteria and a bowling alley. Between 1982 and 2000, a knitting mill occupied the factory spaces of the building, and in 2000, the building was converted into apartments on the upper floors and retail on the ground floor. Today, the building is vacant. We received a letter of support from the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. We also received an approved Part 1 commercial tax credit application from the National Park Service. And the plan for the um, rehab is to have retail on the ground floor and commercial offices above. Any questions? Thank you, Linda. Questions for the board? Or from the board, rather. Uh, Doug, this is Wayne Goodman. I would make a motion. All right, we have a motion to approve. I'll second. This is Wind. Uh, all, any objections or abstentions? All right, that's approved by unanimous consent. Moving on to Williamsburg. Okay, next. Uh, Williamsburg houses a collaborative project of the Federal Public Works Administration, a New Deal agency, and the newly established New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA, is significant under criteria A and C in the areas of community planning, politics and government, and architecture as one of the earliest public housing projects in the United States directly funded by the PWA, as one of the first and most successful projects built by NYCHA, 
and as one of the earliest public housing developments in the United States to incorporate some of the social and design ideas promulgated by European modern architects in the 1920s. The property also meets the registration requirements established in the Multiple Property Documentation Form, Public Housing in the United States, 1933 to 1949. Proposed in 1934, this residential complex was designed by the Williamsburg Associated Architects in 1935 and completed in 1938. The Williamsburg Partnership included prominent architects Richmond Shreve of Shreve, Lamb and Harmon, architects of the Empire State Building, and William Lascaz, the Swiss-born architect who helped introduce modern architecture to America. Lascaz was also influenced by European architects who paired new ideas about design with modern materials and technology to provide improved and affordable urban housing for the working class. Next slide. The nominated property is located in the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn. The 23.3 acre site extends four super blocks east to west and three blocks north to south. The principal north south artery is Avenue of Puerto Rico Grand Avenue. The interior streets are closed to vehicles. In plan, the complex consists of 20 four story buildings turned at 15 degree angles to the street grid. There are three general building configurations. They include eight with H-shaped floor plans, six with floor plans that suggest a lowercase h, and six with T-shaped floor plans. Single store commercial storefronts parallel the streets and adjoin the four buildings for the buildings. These storefronts have streamlined character and curve away from the street at both ends. Oriented to the sun and prevailing winds, the unusual layout produced a series of large and small courts many of which flow into a large public space at the center of each block. The buildings maintain the scale of the neighborhood and provided fundamental human amenities, such as access to ample light and air. Next slide. The buildings themselves exemplify the modern design aesthetic, characterized by their abstracted geometric form, rows of ribbon windows, lack of applied ornament, and honest use of materials. Building elevations are distinguished by their light color, executed in tan brick and exposed concrete. Among the most prominent features are the entrances marked by blue tile and projecting stainless steel canopies and the Hanson streamlined storefronts at ground level. The complex was widely discussed by contemporary critics and more than 25,000 New Yorkers applied for housing in the about 1,600 apartments. <clears throat> According to the Brooklyn Eagle, the Williamsburg houses were one of the most perfect home sites in the world and an eagerly sought spot to live. Income and need form the basis of selection and no tenant can earn more than five times the annual rent. Preference was also given to former residents at the site. Two to five rooms in size, units featured steam heat, hot and cold water, as well as electric stoves and refrigerators. Residents praised their new homes, commenting on the appliances and abundant light. Next slide. <clears throat> During the late 1980s, renovations to the buildings included the removal of some original materials, such as the casement windows. A large facade rehabilitation was completed in the mid 1990s to address original design flaws, such as the lack of flashing and weep holes, which trapped water in the masonry walls, resulting in spalling of the masonry and deterioration of the original steel windows. Under the supervision of NYCHA, the elevations were completely reskinned the parapets replaced, as well as the chimneys, railings, and stone banding. The work was sponsored by NYCHA and done in consultation with the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Rehabilitation of the storefronts, except along Bushwick Avenue, was completed in 2002. The project was executed with great sensitivity, and NYCHA was the recipient, recipient of a preservation award from the New York Landmarks Conservancy, which praised the participants for restoring the complex to better the new condition. Next slide. <clears throat> the ideas presented by the skies in this project influence the subsequent design of other NYCHA housing projects. However, Williamsburg remains one of its most successful examples. Today, the Williamsburg houses continue to function as public housing and still conveys the integrity of the design concepts and layouts of the buildings and their site. The period of significance begins when ground was broken in 1936 and ends in 1945 when 10 unleased commercial spaces were converted to apartments. We received a letter of support from the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. 
We also received an approved part 1 tax credit application from the National Park Service. And the rehabilitation of this public housing complex will provide upgrades necessary for Williamsburg houses to continue to be used as affordable housing. And this will occur in multiple phases. We have the consultant Nick Kerwin um, on the line today. Um, would you like to say a few words? Hi, Linda. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say that, I mean, Linda, that was a great presentation. Uh, it was a joy working with you as well as Kath on this nomination. Uh, we understand the significance of it and I'm looking forward to the redevelopment and the board process of the tax credit. And also would like to thank the review board for taking the time to listen to this nomination. And I think that's about it. Thank you, Nate. And thank you Linda, for a nice presentation. Questions, comments from the board. Uh, this is wind. Uh, I think these are beautiful buildings and they've been beautifully uh, rehabbed. They really are historic. Um, I noticed in the in the uh, uh, text of the of the nomination that uh, uh, before they were built, uh, there was slum clearance uh, that displaced 5,400 people, and the buildings as built uh, could be occupied by 3,000. Uh, I'm sorry that it couldn't have been otherwise. But I think this is uh, terrific, and uh, uh, I'm just surprised that it's not uh, statewide or national in significance as proposed. Uh, but I'd be happy to uh, move the nomination. Thank you, Wynn. And this is any Carol. I'm happy to second it. Great. Um, any any objections or abstentions? There being none, it's approved by unanimous consent. And we will move to Jennifer Betsworth and new Lebanon district number eight school. All right, I guess I can still say good morning. So yep, that's just good. Barely. <laughs> um, so here we are, the new Lebanon district school number eight is significant under criterion C in the area of architecture as a notable local example of the second empire style and of a two story brick schoolhouse. Built in rural Columbia County in the immediate post civil war era, the building is noteworthy for its scale, quality, and use of the popular style. Next. The school is additionally significant under criterion A in the area of education as a significant reminder of the new Lebanon school system during the late 19th century. The building served as a district school through 1913 when New Lebanon and Lebanon Springs established a consolidated district school in Lebanon Springs. Next. The building is also significant in the area of social history for its association with the local Grange chapter, an important rural organization that provided a variety of educational programming, a framework for political organization, and aid to farmers. The new Lebanon Grange chapter, established in 1898, operated from the former school from 1913 through circa 1947. Next. The former school is the subject of a tax credit project, which recently got its part three approval. Um, we're here on the first floor, which has been transformed into the Roaring Twenties Brewery and Tap House. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, we can see the tasting room space there also on the first floor. And if we go to the next slide, we'll go upstairs, which is now an Airbnb used for temporary rentals. So. When you're looking for your next adventure, you could head on to Columbia County and have a nice place to stay and, and get a drink. Uh, the draft was written by Bill Crattinger, and that is the new Lebanon District School. Are there any questions on this one? Do we have a guest that wants to talk about this one? We do not. Okay. Questions or comments? New Lebanon District number eight school. Um, this is Erica Krieger. I will raise my concern that I, um, considering that there's a residential portion built into this, I'll, I'll put my codes hat on. I'm a, I do not see that there's a sprinkler system installed. So that does is concerning to me when you have a residential occupancy, there should be some, um, it, there should be a sprinkler system. So um, I'll just throw that out there. Okay. 
Um, I wasn't involved in the part two and part three process. So maybe it's just not visible in some of these photographs, but if you want to, I can put you in touch with the primary uh, sponsor um, who I've, I've, you know, worked with on this project. If you want to reach out to them about that. Um, sure, sure. Okay. I'll send you a note. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Safety first. We really appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Other questions? Other questions or comments? Do I hear a motion? This is Jay, I'll move it. And a second? Doug, this is Wayne, Wayne Goodman, I'll second. Excellent. All, any objections or abstentions? All right, there being none, it's approved by unanimous consent. And we move now to Lowe's Cameo Theater, Brooklyn. Great, thank you. Lowe's Cameo Theater, now the Philadelphian Sabbath Cathedral, is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as an intact example of a 1920s neighborhood movie palace in New York City. It is additionally significant under Criterion A in the area of entertainment and recreation for its 40 years of use as a local entertainment venue in Crown Heights. Next. Completed in 1924, it opened the following year in an era when architecturally impressive movie theaters were appearing in urban neighborhoods across the United States, few of which survive with their architectural integrity largely intact. Next. The theater was designed by Harrison G. Wiseman, who designed a series of movie palaces using an eclectic array of architectural motifs and materials. Next. On the exterior of the cameo, Wiseman used beige brick with polychrome terracotta, skillfully combining Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and classical motifs. Next. The interior of the theater is largely detailed in the Adamesque style. This is the lobby, which the Philadelphia Church of the Universal Brotherhood transformed into a chapel after they purchased the building in 1974. Next. The theater exclusively screened films produced by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, which was owned by Lowe's. It also hosted live music and dancing, including on its rooftop. While the number of neighborhood theaters declined starting in the 1950s, the cameo remained open through circa 1965. Next. The Philadelphia Church of the Universal Brotherhood, an African-American Seventh-day Adventist congregation, have been good stewards and an important community organization based from the former theater for more than 40 years. This draft was written by a Columbia student um, and is uh, supported by sacred sites. Um, and we do have a letter of support from the New York City uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Are there any questions on this one? This is Carol. I, I don't have a question, but I, I'm very familiar with the building. I ride my bike past it frequently at the right time of year, and it's a wonderful building, and I, I, I'm happy to endorse its listing. Great. All right, we have a motion. Do I hear a second? Are, are there any further questions? I'd be happy to second it. We have a motion and a second, and so we need to hear any objections or abstentions. And there being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, now we move to the Walker Warren House in West Henrietta, Rochester area, and Virginia Bartos. One moment, Doug. No problem. Doug, we're going to advance one item uh, on the agenda to Kath LaFranc's presentations and we'll circle back to Virginia. Excellent. Next is Kath LaFranc with the Lorraine Hansbury Residence, New York, New York. Okay, I am unmuted. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just in time for Women's History Month, I have two interesting nominations. 
um, documenting women's history. Um, both of them were sponsored by the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Program. And these were both done under our third underrepresented um, communities grant. And I have two visitors here today, um, Amanda Davis, project manager for the grant, and Emily Kahn, who is a graduate student in historic preservation at Columbia University. And Emily wrote the nomination for the Women's Live Center. And she will, they're both gonna speak, and I'm delighted to welcome them both. So the first one is the Lorraine Hansberry residence in, on Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. This was previously listed um, in the Greenwich Village Historic District, but we are now nominating it individually. The Hansberry residence is nationally significant under criterion B in the area of literature for its association with pioneering black lesbian playwright, writer, and activist Lorraine Hansberry, who resided in this building from 1953 until 1960, which was the period in which she created her most important works. It was here that she wrote her groundbreaking play, A Raisin in the Sun, and read it aloud to her friend Philip Rose in 1957. Rose went on to produce it, and in 1957, Hansberry made history as the first Black woman to have a play staged on Broadway. Several years later, she became the first Black and the youngest playwright to win the New York Drama Cir Critics Circle Award for Best American Play. The Hansberry residence is also significant under Criterion A, in the areas of social history, LGBT, and ethnic history, Black, because of Hansberry's place at the intersection of race, class, gender, and sexuality. Um, next slide, James. Um, in addition to being a well-known activist who fought for racial equality, Hansberry's work had a tremendous effect on Black Americans. A Raisin in the Sun was one of the first nationally recognized plays to focus on Black characters. Her achievement as a young Black woman was especially remarkable in an age when most Broadway plays were written by older white men. Hansberry opened a new chapter in American theater, one that included um, Black people. Uh, next slide. Uh, as her friend James Baldwin recalled, I had never in my life seen so many Black people in the theater. And the reason was that never before in the entire history of the American theater had so much of the truth of black people's lives been seen on the stage. Black people had ignored the theater because the theater had always ignored them. Baldwin went on to note that the large cast of black characters created an unprecedented opportunity for black actors and nearly a thousand showed up for the aud auditions. Another playwright noted that prior to Raisin, there were occasional roles written by white writers, but they had no real relationship to the realities of African-American life. Um, next, please. Uh, in terms of her sexuality, Hansberry always privately identified as a lesbian, and her attraction to women grew during her life on Bleecker Street, despite her marriage to Robert Nemiroff, a left-wing radical Jew who shared her political views. Although Nemiroff was her most trusted confidant when it came to writing, Hansberry began to explore her lesbian identity within a small social circle while living here. Although she took great care to keep this aspect of her life private, she joined the Daughters of Bilitis, the first national lesbian rights organization, and made contributions to its monthly ma magazine, although always anonymously. Unlike her outspoken role in the black community, she declined to become active in LGBT circles, and she thought and wrote about lesbians such as herself who remained in heterosexual marriages, wondering how many women were not prepared to risk a life alien to what they had been taught all their lives. Nevertheless, her lesbianism was a determining aspect of her life and art. Her husband later wrote that her lesbianism was not a peripheral part of her life, but contributed significantly on many levels to the sensitivity and complexity of her view on human beings and the world. Rain Hansberry was born in Chicago in 1930, her family's experiences of discrimination greatly informed her life and deeply influenced her writing and activism. Um, next, please. She came east in 1950 to study at the New School before publishing her first poem and beginning work on, at Freedom, a leftist magazine founded by Paul Robeson. She became heavily involved in the activist community in Harlem as well as in the Communist Party, which resulted in long-term FBI surveillance. Um, next. Shortly after her 1950 marriage, the couple moved into the Greenwich Village building where she remained until 1960, 
and she bought a larger place a few blocks away and formally parted from Nemiroff. The building was built in um, 1861 and was always divided between retail and residences. In Hansberry's time, there were two upper floor apartments, one on each floor, as it remains today, and she and her husband occupied the thir third floor. Um, next, please. It was very intact to um, Hansberry's period on the exterior, somewhat intact on the interior. Um, the, the apartment itself retains the same general divisions as the floor plan on the left, um, but the rooms have been slightly enlarged or decreased in size. Finishes are mostly contemporary. However, Hansberry recalled that they lived simply amid bookcase lined walls. On the right is the living room fireplace into which she famously uh, threw the unfinished manuscript of Raisin, only to have her husband rescue the pages and put them away until she was ready to work on it again. Um, and that's the fireplace, which is labeled on the left hand side. And then her reading room is the space label, her writing room, I mean, is the space labeled, labeled B2 in that uh, floor plan. And the next slide, please. And this is um, her writing room on the left, and that is a picture of her in that space on the right. Um, and that is part of a series taken after um, the premiere of A Raisin in the Sun. There's a whole series of her taken in that room, I believe. Um, and the next slide, the last slide, and again, this is from the 1959 production of A Raisin in the Sun. As soon as she moved into her own house in 1960, Hansberry began to withdraw from public life to focus on her writing. However, by 1963, she was ill, and tragically, she died of cancer in 1965. She was only 35 years old. I have a letter of support from LPC, and I think Amanda Davis would like to speak about this one. Amanda? Yes, uh, thanks, Kath, and uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to this uh, nomination. We're really proud of this um, the Lorraine Hansberry residence, and um, particularly, it's a wonderful, um, tangible piece of LGBT history, in addition to all the other important histories that she represents. Um, the building is in very close proximity to Stonewall National Monument, and tours are given of Stonewall and surrounding buildings all the time, um, obviously now uh, digitally, but um, we uh, love the fact that people can also visit the Hansberry residence and understand the diverse history of the LGBT community and um, and the impact on her work uh, pre Stonewall, bringing that history even earlier. Uh, we're also working with the New York City Department of Education and a raisin in the sun is a staple of the students high school students um, understanding uh, you know, uh, studies. And so when we talk to the students and are able to include this residence, um, it, especially for uh, gay students of color, we saw the, the looks in their eyes when they were able to kind of see this uh, work and Hansberry uh, with a new light. And uh, it, it was just a, an incredible opportunity to be able to teach this history. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to look at this one. Okay, does anyone have questions about um, the Hansberry residents? This is Kristen Heron. So I just wanted to, really acknowledge how important I thought this nomination was to to recognize Lorraine Hansberry and her story. And I, I thought it was also just really uh, wonderful pointing out that her work, particularly with the Raisin in the Sun, um, that the that home and the power of place was so critical to that story. So it all just ties in really nicely. So so congratulations on that. My one little criticism, and it's really more of a question, is the nomination doesn't include the historic images of Lorraine Hansberry in this space, which to me are so powerful, like here, like we're seeing right yeah. now. And I was wondering why they're not there. Um, just because I didn't have a chance to gather them, but I will put them um, in the That's nomination. Um, you know, I was searching, because I didn't have a lot of images of the, the space, and of course we're limited these days by the pandemic to try to get into these spaces. I was desperately looking online to make this more interesting. And I had read about the, the, this series and I found a bunch of them. And that, that's where I found the other ones about her speaking in Harlem and working at the magazine. And I'm going to include another section with historic photos when, when I send this in. That's great, Kath, because they're, they're really powerful to me. Yeah, to I, I thought the they space. were too. 
Yeah, um, it's a good word I finding like the them. bookcase line. I wish I could have found one with the book. I mean, she talks about it. You know, we lived simply, simply with bookcase lined walls, and I could picture that. But um, I wish I had had her husband pulling the the charred pages out. But I guess they didn't stop to take photos of that. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and everybody. Great comments. Uh, other questions or comments about this nomination? Kristen, I assume that you want to move it. I would absolutely love to. And if, Sarah, go ahead. Carol, I'll second it. Excellent. Uh, any objections or abstentions? There being none, it's approved by unanimous consent. And we move to the Liber Women's Liberation Center. Uh, I found this one especially exciting because I had never heard of it. And I, before I start, I do want to compliment Emily Kahn on her draft. It's one of the best student drafts I've read. I think she's a student of Andrews. Um, at any rate, this is the Women's Liberation Center, which is on West 20th Street in Chelsea. The Women's Liberation Center is significant under criterion A in the areas of social history, LGBT, and social history, women's rights. As the first permanent women's advocacy space and lesbians, or uh, I'm sorry, permanent permanent advocacy space for women's and lesbians organizations in New York City, and as one of the earliest examples of a feminist advocacy space nationwide. Founded in 1970 and relocated to this building in 1972, the Women's Liberation Center, or the WLC, served as a meeting house and a clearinghouse for numerous grassroots uh, radical organizations associated with women's and lesbians liberation movements. Because the center welcomed diverse organizations with differing perspectives, it helped to create a more expansive and radical version of feminism and affirmed the need for women's spaces in a male-oriented society. In addition to serving as a pioneering women's space, the center helped to cultivate lesbian activism both within and separate from the general gay liberation movement, which was male dominated and often overlooked lesbian issues. The WLC also fostered an important partnership between feminists and lesbians, a welcome relief from the earlier tension that had characterized the second wave feminist movement, whose leaders felt that partnering with lesbians would jeopardize their acceptance. The building is exceptionally significant under criterion exception G because of its pivotal and, and sustaining involvement in numerous aspects of the women's rights movement in the 70s, as well as its early and pioneering importance in the struggle for lesbian civil rights. So next slide. So this building began its life as a firehouse, possibly built as early as 1854, but more likely rebuilt in 1865 after the creation of the Metropolitan Fire Department. It's typical for the period. It's brick, three stories tall, three bays wide, stone still, sills, cast iron, and sheet metal decoration in the Italianate style. This photo is from the 80s, and it shows the building during the period of significance. So you can still see the double doors for the engine, pedestrian door behind it, and they're within a large cast iron enframement. So next. Um, the only change, oh, well, the windows, I believe, have been replaced, but the only change which occurred in the 1990s after the period of significance is that the engine doors within the enframement were replaced by this configuration, which kind of suggests an overhead door, and the large glass transom was added, and there is a new entrance. So we can say that the exterior is still rec uh, recognizable as a firehouse, However, because there's no fire, there are no firehouse features on the interior, we could not include that earlier significance um, as a firehouse in the nomination. So the firehouse served the city until 1967, but within a few years it had been abandoned. So next slide. Meanwhile, by 1972, the fledgling Women's Liberation Center, which had been founded in 1970 in a much smaller space, was desperate for a larger and more stable meeting place. The group managed to secure a long-term lease from the city on this building, but it came with no money for repairs or maintenance. The women did all the repairs themselves, including major roof on the work, basement furnace, and the interior, which was in terrible condition. They created a flexible series of classrooms, offices, meeting spaces, and a large studio. The interior spaces were very basic as they had to serve many diverse groups and purposes, from single events to regular meetings. 
Unfortunately, we have no photo documentation of what those spaces looked like. But we know from interviews that it was cozy, furnished with old furniture, probably heated by stoves, and very often cold. We think there was one large room in the front of the main store, a meeting room and office on the second floor, and a large studio-like space and office on the third floor. These rooms were used and reused for all different purposes, so they were probably changed many times. Such a, a long list of activities were held here that I can't read them all, but different classes and workshops were held on martial arts, theater, dance, self-defense, music, job hunting skills, hair cutting, architecture, art therapy, and storytelling. There were financial workshops, a feminist credit union, a food collective, a feminist lending library, information clearing houses on all sorts of um, information for women, housing, contacts, an emphasis on serving low-income, minority, disabled, or older women who could seek information on all sorts of housing, counseling, and training. Um, there was an emphasis on um, low-income and minority women, disabled women, and the intent was cr to create a holistic experience for women who could find political, physical, spiritual, and educational enrichment. For lesbians, the center offered a meeting space for fledgling organizations and a launch pad for new ones. Um, next slide. Two of the most important were the Lesbian Feminist Liberation and next, the Lesbian Switchboard. Um, leaders from both of these groups um, later became active and held leadership roles in national organizations. The space also provided an opportunity for a reconciliation between formerly hostile members of the National Organization for Women, or NOW, and lesbians. The WLC gave lesbian women increased autonomy to advocate for their own rights, both within and separate from the general gay liberation movement. <laughs> the WLC closed in 1987 after a new um, lesbian and gay community center opened on West 13th Street. Groups started to drift there and dues became sparse um, and the city raised the rent. Although the center had served its purpose, its 15 year history was an important period in women's rights, during which the WLC paved a pivotal role in affirming the need for spaces run by and for women at a time where there were few spaces for women's act advocacy. The center showed how these spaces could be used as a source of female empowerment, independence, and liberation. Several of the groups um, that met there thrived long after it closed, dem demonstrating its power to nurture, nurture successful grassroots interests into independent organizations. Some of the discussions that began there became the basis for legislative changes, and some of its leaders became national leaders. Um, next slide. Um, today, the building is used by the nonprofit Non Traditional Employment for Women, or NEW which trains cisgender, transgender, and minority women and non-binary individuals for unionized jobs in the building trades. Just as it did in 1972, the building still serves as an empowerment space for women, a fitting continuation of the WLC's mandate. In the 1990s, new configured the interior, reconfigured the interior. These are some contemporary photos. This is the basement, basement workshop. Um, the next slide, a classroom. And finally, a third floor space. Um, and this may be the original studio space described by the WLC. And it's hard to assess integrity to 72 because we have no photos to compare it to. But the Women's Live Center was an abandoned space rehabbed in 1972 for use as flexible classroom meeting and event space by a diversity of women for a variety of different uses. Other than its division into these variable reusable spaces, the plan, size of rooms, and decorative qualities played no role in determining its use and are not related to its significance. Even the two women we um, interviewed could not remember what it looked like. Today, the building is divided into similarly flexible spaces for classrooms, training, and gatherings. The primarily passive meetings and gatherings of the WLC have been replaced by the more active classes and training sessions of the new women. It, their spatial character and finishes do not make any difference in the program either. So the building's general character as a flexible space for classes and gatherings entirely dedicated to the entire empowerment of women 
remains consistent and intact enough to convey the building's significant themes. Um, Emily, you would like to speak. Yes, thank you, Kath, and I greatly appreciate your kind words, and I am, in fact, the student of Andrew Dolcart. I just want to add that I've spoken to multiple women involved with this site, as well as employees of non-traditional employment for women, and it has been universally expressed how important this building and this site has been in empowering women, in creating self-determination for women, and really being an inclusive space for all women, regardless of their sexual identity, their racial background, their socioeconomic status. And in light of the fact that it's Women's History Month, it's so appropriate that this community is now getting the recognition and the awareness that it deserves. So I know this nomination means a lot to many women in the women's and lesbians liberation movements. It means a lot to us at the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. And I greatly appreciate all of your consideration today. So thank you very much. Uh, and I forgot to add that I have a letter of support, a very excited letter of support from LPC. And also it's owned by, um, Amanda, remind me who it's owned by a city agency who was, um, which was very excited to support the nomination as well. Who's it owned by Amanda? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I think Ken okay, would know forgot, best. But whichever <laughs> agency it was, they were very happy to support this nomination. All right, thank you, Emily and Kath. Um, any questions or comments about the Women's Liberation Center? Yeah, this is Kristen Heron. I, I also want to congratulate Emily. You know, you as a student, you have two of the nominations put forward today, and you did do a really great job. So, so congratulations on that. Um, I have kind of a macro question maybe about this nomination. Um, so earlier in the morning, we heard a couple of nominations whose um, period of significance needed to conclude at 1971, because that's 50 years out. This nomination starts in 1972. So, I, Kath, maybe this is for you. Could you just okay. give the audience the broader context of how we can consider a nomination when it's technically sure. under 50? Well, sure. It can be considered if it's exceptionally significant. And the women's liberation, the second wave, I have just learned that there is a first wave and a second wave, the first wave being um, suffrage and the second wave being the women's liberation movement of the 70s, which is about empowering women. The first wave was getting the vote. The second wave is this empowerment of women that we saw in the 70s with organizations like now and and um, this is that context didn't even start until night till, you know, that period. And so it's only the sec it's either the first or the second. Uh, space devoted to women's advocacy. There's one, I believe, in San Francisco that may or may not be earlier or the same time. And so I think the nomination quite clearly explained in all the diverse activities that took place here um, how this made an extraordinary, you know, exceptionally significant contribution to the women's liberation movement and to the lesbian uh, right, civil rights movement. In a, in a period, you know, it really almost um, presented the period as exceptionally significant and how this was the first and one of the earliest. And as the nomination kind of goes into, by the time they moved out, there were multiple spaces like this. And, you know, maybe it wouldn't have been so significant if it were founded in the 80s, but that in the 70s, this was an exceptionally significant movement. And this was one of the first um, to promote this kind of empowerment for women. So that's why I think it's exceptionally significant. And I think Emily has done a really exceptional job of, in fact, I wanted to say it was nationally significant, but I think I would have to ask Emily to write a few more paragraphs about what was happening in San Francisco or other places. And I'm not sure that she wants to do that. So that is that answer your question, Kristen, or? Yeah, that definitely helps, Kath. And it's funny, I was thinking about the national significance too, not to create more work, but <laughs> this really did oh, make the case. We'll I guess to, maybe Emily can get an A plus yeah. <laughs> or something. Um, just a quick question, um, and this is maybe for my um, edification. Um, in present taking this further to the National Park Service, does it need to, like, does a nomination that's technically under 50 years have to explicitly state, like, 
here's why we're nominating it, even though it's not quite 50. Like, will, will yes. the park service have any issue? Um, yes. And again, I'm not saying I have issue with the nomination. I was just yeah. curious about that. No, it does. And you'll see at the top of the nomination, um, it usually says explain criteria exceptions. And that's why I said it's exceptionally significant under criterion exception G, which is less than 50 years old, because whatever I said, it's pivotal role in the women's liberation movement of the 1970s. Maybe I should expand that a little bit. Um, no, that's me, Kath, missing that box. So well, I, mean, I apologize. Actually, I was focused on the narrative. Truth, and, yeah, you know. to tell you the truth, we've had um, great luck recently, especially with some of our artist nominations that you've reviewed, expanding things into the 80s and 90s. Um, the Park Service seems very receptive to this. Um, if the scholarship is there these days, I think Kathy will agree with me on that. Um, they don't seem to be in that stogy mood that we have to wait 50 years because history is changing so fast. And because if we're going to represent underrepresented groups and um, themes, a lot of those happened within the last 50 years. And that's the only way to catch up and to recognize these groups. I'm not going to say, oh, you have to wait 50 years. So NPS has been very receptive to that, and we've been all been very pleased. That's great. Um, that's great. And uh, oh, I apologize. I uh, had it in my head that Emily had written to today. So my apologies. You have written to, but at a different uh, meetings. So thank you for correcting me on that. Um, I'm happy to move this nomination forward unless other folks have things to say. Okay, other questions or comments about the Women's Liberation Center? No, this is all the second. Okay, Erica, you got it. Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. Jennifer Lamack got second. Any objections or abstentions? There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, Kat. Thank, Thank you all. all. Thank so you all. Thank you, Amanda and um, Emily. All right, we're going to go back to Walker Warren House and Virginia Bartos now. Yeah, I guess we will. But can I confirm who was first on that nomination? The woman, uh, Kristen Harrod. Kristen, thank you. Sorry. Yep. All right, Walker Warren. Uh, can, can can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, uh, I'm calling. The I was calling this in on my phone because I've been having trouble with the connection. So, um, just let me know if you're having problems here. Okay. Um, no, you sound very clear. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have 1 nomination to present. The Walker Ward house in West Henrietta. Monroe County, uh, built in 1897. The Walker Warren House is a wood clapboard sided two and one half story residence located on the east, east side of West Henrietta Road, just north of the intersection of Erie Station Road. It is significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a free classic variant of the Queen Anne style of, with character defining features that include an irregular form, different textures in the siding, projecting bays, a wraparound porch, and a hipped and lower cross gabled roof. Other features are a mix of wood, clapboard, and shingle siding in the fluted wood columns on the porch, grouped in threes on tall square bases. An extraordinary document was left behind by the builders of the house that records on brown paper the date of construction and the names of the architect, builders, masons, and painters. The architect was a local builder named Myron H. Pope, who was assisted by another local builder, James L. Cox. Next slide, please. Here we see some interior views of the house, namely the entryway, staircase, one of the bedrooms, and the dining room in the lower right. It's in the details of the interior where Pope's talent as a designer is evident, 
along with the skills of the builders. The interior features a number of classical elements, such as the large Tuscan order columns seen in the upper left, windows with pronounced plain cornices, window trim molded to simulate fluted columns, and high molded baseboards giving the illusion of height. More features are described in the nomination, so I won't bore you with them in this presentation. Next slide, please. The map shows West Henrietta Road and the nominated property in 1902. The road played a formative role in the history of the village of West Henrietta as it was one of two major north-south overland routes in the town's early history. West Henrietta Road remained a major north-south route linking the village to the city of Rochester until the construction of Interstate 390 in the late 1960s. The nominated property is also significant under Criterion A in the area of social history as the primary dwelling of two important residents of West Henrietta. The first, Dr. Charles, Charles E. Walker, was a university trained homeopathic physician who also served as a local election officer and town representative to state Republican conventions. He was also known for having the first telephone in the village. The house seen in the lower image was built for Dr. Walker 10 years after he moved his wife and son to West Henrietta Road. His house and the houses across the road represent the late 19th century growth of this part of the village. Next slide, please. The historic barn is also on the property along with two smaller buildings seen in the lower images. The north side of the house seen in the upper left has an entrance that opens into what was presumably Dr. Walker's office. The entrance is marked by the bracketed roof seen in the left of the center projecting wing. Stephen Warren was the other prominent resident, active in the local community, but best known as a well-known and respected lawyer. He was also Monroe County District Attorney from 1898 to 1907, after which he established his own law firm with offices in downtown Rochester. The house's location along West Henrietta Road was convenient for Warren for driving to and from Rochester, which he did well into his late 80s. Two small buildings were added by Stephen Warren, or I should say the two small buildings were added by Stephen Warren, who bought the property in 1910. The Warrens had one daughter and a garden shed on the left was actually built for her as a playhouse. Um, I would like to introduce Michael Hedding, owner of the house, and thank him for his assistance in sponsoring and assisting with drafting the nomination. Um, Michael, would you like to add anything to the presentation? Michael? He's unmuted. I can't, I can't hear him though. He's not speaking. Oh. Well, anyway, <laughs> comments, questions? Okay, uh, comments and questions about the Walker Warren House in West Henrietta from the board. Uh, hi, this is this is Wayne. I just wanted to say uh, that I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with this property. I've driven by it uh, on numerous occasions, but I particularly uh, enjoyed looking at the interior images, which I I found to be pretty fascinating. So, so thank you. I support this certainly. And I, if no one else has any comments or questions, I would certainly move this forward. All right. Without other questions or comments, we have a motion to approve the Walker House. Do I hear a second? This is Erica. I'll do the second. Any objections or abstentions? There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, Virginia. And we now will move to Dan Bagro and the Church Hill Historic District in Saratoga County. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> Doug, oh, sorry. So sorry to interrupt. Sorry, Dan Bagra. Go ahead, Daniel. Can we confirm the first and second on that? That's Wayne. We had Wayne. Wayne and Erica, I believe. Yes. 
thank you. Just wanted to get things straight here. Yep. I'll do the housekeeping first. Dan Bagra, all yours. Go ahead, Dan. Okay. The Churchill Historic District is being nominated in association with Criterion C in the area of architecture as a locally significant district reflecting popular 19th and early 20th century architectural styles with a period of significance from 1817 to 1925. Next slide, please. Located in New York State's Saratoga County, the Churchill Historic District is situated within the hamlet of Crescent in the town of Half Moon at the southern edge of the county along the Mohawk River. The built environment of the district is reflective of residential growth within the hamlet as a result of Crescent's development as a regional transportation and manufacturing hub from the mid 19th to the early 20th century. Industry in the town of Half Moon was slow to develop until the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. At that point, many new uh, many new mills appeared and numerous new industries were founded. The hamlet of Crescent became a focus of economic development in the 1800s, where it was here that the Erie Canal was carried over the Mohawk River via the Crescent Aqueduct. Next slide, please. The district consists largely of 19th century building stock, some of which shares direct association with the hamlet's preeminent 19th century resident, Colonel Alfred C. Noxon. The nominated district, while small in size, nevertheless retains a strong sense of place given its elevated and commanding position immediately north of the Mohawk River. A total of 13 contributing and seven non-contributing resources are located within the boundary. The non-contributing resources are all limited to outbuildings built after the period of significance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the district is characterized by undulating topography with buildings situated on spacious lots and sited to take advantage of the commanding southern view overlooking the Mohawk River. Well, uh, most of the properties were constructed before the flooding of the river for the transition from the Erie Canal to the Barge Canal in 1918. And the view we see here in the two photos is taken from the south side of the Mohawk River looking north towards the district. The district contains a collection of buildings that largely represent the Hamlet's development in the 19th century, including those of both high style and vernacular characteristics. The Greek Revival style is well represented and the district additionally includes several buildings that exhibit transitional Greek Revival and Italian style characteristics. Next slide, please. <clears throat> also represented is an early example of an octagon plan house seen in the left two images, along with two buildings that employ distinctive Egyptian inspired Cavetto cornices, one of which is seen on the right. Next slide, please. During the, uh, the height of its popularity, Crescent boasted an ironworks, paint shop, brickworks, hotel, bank, a commercial block, and a canal store. The hamlet became a canal shipping point for ice, grain, hay, and molder sand produced in southern Saratoga County. By 1860, the population was nearly 600, of which 75 to 100 were employed by Alfred Knoxon. Of note are three prominent Crescent buildings, the Farmer's Bank, also known as the Noxon Bank, in the top left image, the Colonel Noxon House in the bottom left, and Oak Cliff on the right. These three buildings illustrate many of the prevailing themes of the Greek Revival style. Uh, two of them are the architectural manifestations of Noxon's investment and residency in Crescent, while the third represents the temple front house type in this instance. Uh, distinguished by its elevated and landscaped site and by its dual portico design. The buildings, along with a well-built but less sophisticated brick house at 57 Churchill Road, provide some sense of the range of expression of this pervasive national architectural style. Next slide, please. The Hamlet has undergone significant change during the 20th century. In 1918, the Mohawk River was flooded to accommodate the Barge Canal, which relied on a series of dams and locks added to the river. This necessitated that the Crescent Aqueduct be dismantled, seen in the bottom right image, uh, partially dismantled. <clears throat> Only small parts of the abutments remain on the north and south shores of the river. The north abutment is included in the district boundary. Additionally, uh, continued development and the transition to automobiles as the primary means of transportation altered Crescent. But the assemblage of properties within the district nevertheless recalls the earlier period of prosperity seen during, seen during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Viewed collectively, 
These resources portray Crescent's historic development and maintain a strong sense of place. Next slide, please. A minor change since the draft nomination was submitted to the board is the inclusion of Crescent Terminal, which is at the end of Terminal Road and already a contributing resource uh, to uh, the a contributing resource to the Barge Canal National Historic Landmark. In the current image, you can see the aqueduct remnants in the foreground, uh, with the Crescent Terminal being the bulkhead-like structure at the end of the parking lot area. It's the intention to include both the aqueduct ruins and the Crescent Terminal in the nomination. Uh, and if the nomination is approved today, the draft would be amended to reflect this change. Next slide, please. Letters of support have been received from Half Moon's acting town historian, the president of the Half Moon Historical Society, and the Saratoga County historian. Uh, the town board has also passed a resolution supporting the designation of the historic district on the National Register. The draft, draft was written by me with contributions from Bill Crattinger and district resident George Harris. Uh, George is with us today, and I'm not sure if he'd like to say a few words, but if he does, I'd like to give him an opportunity. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to express our appreciation to the State Review Board for the wonderful work they do. Um, and I'd also like to express my appreciation for the work that Bill Crattinger has done on this in the past and the extensive effort that you put to, into this. It's been a real pleasure to work with you and the board. Thank you, George, and thank you, Dan. Um, so of the 13 contributing properties in this district, the canal abutment is not currently one of those? Uh, correct. It, uh, I, you are correct, yes. There's, I guess it would be uh, 14 contributing resources then. And what about that bulkhead thing? Is that going to be a 15th resource or is it associated with the, the uh, abutment? <clears throat> the 13 includes the abutment. Uh, the 14th would be the bulkhead. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And um, so this is uh, criterion C only. Why not, why not add A and some discussion of Noxon and or the canal history to this nomination? Well, the, Bill and uh, so Bill Crattinger worked with me on this, and we discussed uh, some additional potential criteria. Um, one of them we talked about was potentially commerce, and we felt that they're just the the building stock here really is entirely residential. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from you know these minor, well, not minor, but these these limited canal resources that are included within the boundary, um, the bulk of the district reflects the residential community. Uh, not the larger uh, hamlet of Crescent, which had a number of commercial properties and businesses. Uh, and so we just felt that it was the most straightforward argument to focus on the architecture. Um, and we could not really come to a consensus on additional criteria to add to this. So we just uh, have defaulted to the architectural argument. Uh, that's a great response. Thank you. Other questions or comments about Church Hill? Uh, I thought we, we we worked. I thought we had put that bank on. And that came up several years back. I think it was put on, was it not? And I remember there was a lot of discussion about the stairs, if they were original to the building. And I, I believe it was said they were. Yeah, well, there's three of these area. properties. Uh, you are correct. I should have noted that uh, both Oak Cliff, seen on the right, and the Noxon Bank in the top left corner. Uh, those are both individually listed on the National Register already. That is a terrific area. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the, the, the capital districts, this area is in really uh, has gone under amazing changes. A lot, a lot of development going on there. And this is the gem. And I believe at that dock, wasn't there a former uh, very controversial um, vessel tied up there for quite a while? Uh, that had some significance with uh, travel on the Erie Canal. Uh, does anybody remember that? And uh, there was a question if it was ever going to get moved or not. Right there, yeah. Does anyone remember that? Um, it was, uh, there was a lot of controversy. I mean, that probably goes back 20 years ago, but it was a neat vessel, but the, uh, the, the people that owned it just were running out of money. I don't know what ever happened to it, but it had to get out of there. I would love to not make that area. I, I think it's a real uh, gem in this area. It's a wonderful location, beautiful location. And as I said, a lot of development going around it. It is, uh, it's, 
It'd be great to keep it the way it, it is. It's it's a marvelous piece of property area. That sounded like it was Tom Maggs, but since they well, I'm sorry, I forget about that. You know, by advanced stage, you know, I'm not as old as Wint, but I'm getting closer to him. But thank you, Tom. I apologize for that. We well, we will time? respond by seconding Tom's uh, motion for adoption. Thank you, cousin Wint. <laughs> Do I hear any objections or abstentions? There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Thank you all. A true family event. Indeed. <clears throat> uh, moving on okay. to Westport Historic District, a, a much larger entity. The Westport Historic District is being nominated in association with Criterion A in the areas of commerce, entertainment and recreation and community planning and development, as well as Criterion C in the area of architecture. The district is locally significant with a period of significance from 1825 to 1940. Next slide, please. Located in the hamlet and town of Westport in eastern Essex County, the nominated historic district is situated adjacent to the western shore of Lake Champlain and is set amidst the dramatic natural scenery of that part of northeastern New York's Champlain Valley with its visually inspiring combination of expansive lake and mountain vistas. To the west of the hamlet rise the rugged landforms of the Adirondack Mountains, while to the east across a broad expanse of Lake Champlain, the viewshed is framed in the distance by Vermont's Green Mountains. Next slide, please. The district area is characterized by a substantially intact and cohesive collection of residential, commercial, civic, and religious architecture that illustrates the development, growth, and prosperity of the hamlet during that time. Developed in large, large measure in the 100-year period spanning 1820 to 1920, the historic district contains a wide range of architecture representative of a variety of distinctive periods, architectural fashions, and building types, including Greek Revival, Italianate, Second Empire, Queen Anne, and Colonial Revival. Next slide, please. The architecture contained within the Westport Historic District corresponds with a variety of relevant themes in the community's history. Much of the earlier architecture speaks to a period of prosperity when Westport was an important Lake Champlain shipping point for farm goods, natural resources, and other materials, while much of the later architecture speaks to that time when Westport emerged as a popular seasonal destination beginning during the last quarter of the 19th century and extending into the 20th century. The nominated district remains in large measure free from more recent and incompatible development and presents an appearance and a decided sense of place reflective of its 19th and early 20th century history. Next slide, please. Westport's history was in part shaped by influ influential events, among them the military campaigns of the 19th century, uh, excuse me, of the 18th century, and by the ongoing and steady development of lake-related transportation, industry, and commerce from the post-revolutionary period onwards. Westport's early fortunes were tied to the lake and it soon emerged as an important point of dispatch for the region's abundant natural resources, among them Adirondack lumber and iron, along with surplus agricultural products from the outlying farm area. The steady traffic of commercial vessels also offered a means for bringing manufactured goods into the hamlet from distant points of manufacture. That natural bay, one of the largest on either shore of Lake Champlain, offered a protective port for the shipment of goods and materials and for the transportation of people. As a result, early construction in Westport centered around its waterfront area, while iron manufacturing played what might be termed an equal role with agriculture and lumbering in the fortunes of the local economy during the first half of the 19th century. By 1850, it had become Westport's most important and vital industry. Next slide, please. However, Westport's economy was in a precipitous state of decline in the post-Civil War era, and it was evident that the town and hamlet could no longer hope for prosperity from the iron furnaces, such as that of the Lake Champlain Ore and Iron Company, which was established but quickly failed. Coinciding with the arrival of the railroad was a disastrous 1876 fire, which destroyed a considerable section of the hamlet. The new economic impetus offered by the railroad undoubtedly spurred new development, 
already necessitated by the losses incurred by the fire. Next slide, please. Between 1880 and 1900, Westport became firmly established as a popular tourist summer tourist spot and also as an ideal location for second homes for many wealthy families from New York City and Boston. During this period, many of Westport's larger homes were reinvented to serve as accommodations catering to summer visitors or otherwise were recast as private second homes for seasonal use by their owners. Westport continued to benefit from its position as a prominent Adirondack resort and destination through the 1930s. After the Second World War, with the advent of air travel and the construction of the Northway, the latter which bypassed Westport, the Hamlet's, pop the Hamlet's popularity as a summer resort entered into a marked period of decline. Westport is today primarily a residential community with a significant population that considers the Hamlet a second home. Next slide, please. I received one email of support from a district resident and a letter of objection from the school superintendent, though only private owners can formally object to the nomination. The school district plans to sell the property and believes that being within the district will limit this, but it should be noted that as a contributing property within the district, a future developer would be able to potentially take advantage of tax credit opportunities. <clears throat> this nomination was sponsored by the town of Westport and uh, primarily written by William Crattinger with significant assistance from district residents, William Johnston and Nancy Page, and uh, Bill is on the is participating in our meeting today, and he would like to say a few words on behalf of the nomination. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, this uh, nomination uh, has been a marathon process, and it dates back to the early 1980s when Ray Smith uh, spoke to a group of people in Westport uh, talking about uh, the uh, benefits of creating an historic district. Uh, following Ray's presentation, the New York State Council on the Arts awarded funding to begin the survey process, which was uh, designed and managed by uh, Tanya Wierpitzki. And uh, there were two areas in the village that were identified as uh, potential historic districts, a so-called South Main Street district and an area uh, near the uh, the uh, DNH uh, Railroad Depot, the so-called North Pleasant Street Historic District. Uh, the uh, initial um, nominations uh, uh, were, were drafted along with uh, 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 almost a hundred blue forms. It was a tremendous uh, piece of research, and uh, the the actual. Uh, uh, Completion of the nomination process lagged for a number of years. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, Essex County Fairgrounds was uh, separately nominated and uh, placed on the National Register. In uh, 2014, the Preservation League of New York State uh, granted the town uh, funding to upgrade the nomination to bring together the, the two areas, the South Main Street area and the North Pleasant Street area and to bring in the properties uh, in between those, those two areas. Uh, the, uh, the staff of uh, Office of Parks and Recreation has been a tremendous help in, uh, help, uh, in uh, enabling this nomination to be uh, completed and brought before the review board. And I'm very appreciative uh, for all the work they've done. And I am very appreciative of the fact that the state review board is considering this nomination today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thanks, Dan. Uh, this is a district that has 24 previously listed properties in it, it and it really has a really nice early treatment of the early history, uh, specifically the late 1700s. But I gather there are no buildings of any kind from before 1820 uh, in this district. Is that correct? There was one schoolhouse that is no longer extant? Uh, yes, that is uh, that is uh, correct. Interesting. Yeah, really well well done early history. Uh, other questions or comments about Westport? It's such a huge effort to see a district with 330 properties, uh, and I commend the people that worked on this and, and the duration of time it took. Um, do I hear a motion? This is Jay. I'll make a motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second. This is Wind. 
Jay and Wood, first and second. Any objections or abstentions? There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Uh, th th thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, moving on to the stone buildings of Jefferson County, uh, multiple property listing. <clears throat> I'm glad to bring this MPDF to you today. Uh, an MPDF is essentially a cover document or umbrella that is used to help make it easier to list individual resources. In the future, authors nominating stone buildings in Jefferson County uh, will be able to reference this context and avoid needing to rewrite it. This form is specifically concerned with historic limestone and sandstone buildings erected in Jefferson County, New York in the first three quarters of the 19th century. It's the intention that this document will simplify the nomination process and help property owners to achieve national register uh, recognition. Most, if not all, of the stone buildings in the county have been documented in the study list included uh, with the uh, draft of the MPDF. Next slide, please. Uh, and this map uh, does not include all 108 properties included in the study list, uh, but includes most of them uh, and helps give you a sense of the distribution throughout the county. The earliest resource identified to date in this context is the National Register listed 1806 Loray Land Office, while the most recent dates to 1872 when the, uh, with the Copley Adams Duford Stone Office was erected. By the 1870s, the use of traditional stone construction in Jefferson County was waning. Next slide, please. The buildings shown throughout this presentation reflect the twofold character of this MPDF. On the one hand, there are buildings built for the early and preeminent French landowners of much of the county, James Leray de Ch uh, Chaumont and John Lafarge, and on the other, 19th century farmhouses and buildings built by English, Dutch, uh, and German settlers to the area, many of who whom were recruited by Leray de Chaumont's land agents. What unites these buildings is not only the stone used in their construction, available in abundance in Jefferson County, but also the aesthetic will to utilize it when timber was equally or even more plentiful in the area and certainly much easier to work with. At present, 108 19th century stone buildings have been documented. Next slide, please. There is one property type eligible for inclusion in this MPDF buildings of load-bearing limestone or sandstone construction that are located in Jefferson County that were erected in the circa 1800 to 1875 period. The unifying theme that associates these resources with one another and forms the basis for this group's eligibility for nomination is their traditional stone construction and craftsmanship. The principal property type is domestic, consisting of both vernacular and high-style dwellings and representing a diverse range of types and forms. Other building types, though far less prevalent in number within the larger group, represent historic civic, educational, commercial, industrial, and religious uses. These have been broken down to include houses, taverns, hotels, military barracks, banks, stores, blacksmith shops, land offices, mills, schools, jails, hospitals, meeting houses, and churches. These sub subtypes constitute the full range of represented building types and will be considered within the context of three periods of historic development, 1800 to 1830, 1830 to 1850, and 1850 to 1875, which corresponds to some extent with national architectural trends and the successive federal Greek revival and picturesque styles. Next slide, please. The 1800 to 1830 period includes houses that represent early vernacular uh, vernacular building traditions, as well as those of more heightened architectural character inspired by the neoclassical movement and characterized by the use of forms and decorative motifs derived from the architecture of classical Rome. The houses of many prominent early residents and families are represented, as are those that are associated with people of more ordinary experience. The prevailing architectural fashion of this period was the federal style, popular in New York State in the circa 1800 to 1830 period and in rural areas into the early 1830s. Next slide, please. The period of 1830 to 1850 is characterized by the emergence and sustained popularity of the Greek Revival style, uh, which reached rural areas of New York in the early 1830s 
and predominated in the early to mid 1840s. By this time, the county's stone buildings, stone building culture had become well established as demonstrated by the proliferation of construction activity in the preceding two decades. Next slide, please. The period of 1850 to 1875 represents the first of uh, the final quarter century of stone construction in Jefferson County. It corresponds with major paradigm shifts in architecture at the national level as the classical motives of the federal and Greek revival styles had given way to the newer picturesque modes, namely the Gothic, Gothic revival and Italianate styles. Advances in construction technology also changed in this period so these had limited bearing on the county's stone masonry tradition. Construction was more limited in this period with fewer houses and new stone buildings being constructed. Next slide, please. The registration requirements of the MPDF are largely concerned with the use and integrity of stone as the primary building material. The requirements have made accommodations, particularly with regard to wood frame wings, which may have been altered or expanded, as we'll see in our next presentation, but nonetheless maintain the integrity of the stone section of the building. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Contrasted with other counties in New York State, Jefferson County ranked fourth in the number of stone buildings in 1855. Only the earlier settled counties of New York, Ulster, and Kings exceeded Jefferson in the number of stone dwellings. Many of the properties on the study list have already been nominated to the National Register, either individually or as contributing resources within districts. But comparatively, this resource type is still rare and there are many properties not yet added to the register. This draft nomination was written by Ann Barros and Claire Bonney with editing and contributions by Bill Krattinger and I. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any questions about the stone buildings, multiple property designation? Uh, this is weird. I think the, the historical write-up, the, the presentation of the context, not only historical and architectural, but also geological is uh, absolutely terrific. And uh, it ought to really open the way for more nominations of individual buildings in this extremely interesting building type. Uh, and I'd be happy to to, to move its uh, uh, approval. This is Tom Maggs, and I'd be happy to second it. I, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful nomination. Wonderful. Any other questions? I, I would just like to add, too, that uh, Anne and Claire are they're in the meeting with us today. They indicated they did not have a desire to speak, but I'm sure that they appreciate the comments. That's great. Any other comments? Any objections or abstentions for this nomination? There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. And now, Dan, is the Ballard House then one of the specific forms that stems from having this multiple property designation? That's correct. Yep. Yeah, we're uh, this is this is this goes along with it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Continue. Sure. The Samuel F. Ballard House is being nominated in association with Criterion C at the local significance level as a well-preserved example of limestone construction in Jefferson County from the first quarter of the 19th century with a period of significance of circa 1825. The house is being nominated in association with the multiple property documentation form entitled Stone Buildings in Jefferson County, New York, circa 1800 to 1875 and satisfies the registration requirements as laid out in that document. Next slide, please. The property is located just north of the hamlet of Talcott Corners on County Route 64 in the southeastern corner of the town of Watertown, Jefferson County. The immediate setting is rural and characterized by a cleared area around the house with mature tree trees surrounding the property. Next slide, please. The one and a half story side gabled stone building has an attached wood frame wing, which has been raised from its original one story height and which includes a rear cross gabled section. Except for a rear second story window, all window and door openings in the stone section are spanned by splayed stone lintels and window openings have cut stone sills and the front door has a stone threshold. The limestone walls were laid up in lime mortar in regular courses on the facade and north gable end with roughly rectangular and square shaped stones of relatively even thickness. On the rear elevation, the stone was laid up in more irregular fashion, being only roughly coursed. 
The stone exhibits a deep gray hue and may have been pulled from nearby ledges, but is otherwise similar in character to that used by the nearby Talcott Tavern listed on the National Register. The facade of the stone section is five bays wide with a center entrance and was oriented to face eastwards. The windows are hung with 12 over 12 wood sash. A shallow wood cornice terminates the stone wall, though it is currently obscured behind an attached gutter. A brick chimney with a corbelled top rises from the west side of the roof ridge. Next slide, please. The first floor of the stone house's interior was laid out on a one and one half room deep plan with an enclosed staircase separating two larger front rooms and a narrower range of rooms behind. The south side of the plan now consists of a single open volume, but like the north side, was once separated into a larger front and smaller rear room. Among the more interesting features of the interior are the wide plank floors. Some floorboards on the first floor are over 19 inches wide, and these were incised with parallel lines to imitate narrower tongue and groove flooring. Given, the nail, given the nail, that the nailing pattern appears consistent with this treatment, there are two nails per incised narrow board, it may well be original. Next slide, please. Also present on the property is a circa 1825 stone smokehouse, a circa 1825 barn foundation, and a post-1970 non-contributing interconnected building consisting of a pole barn, cabin, and greenhouse tucked away behind the main house. Samuel Ballard's parents moved to Oneida County from New Hampshire just prior to his birth in 1792. Ballard and his two older brothers would purchase land in the Talcott Corner area of Watertown with Samuel Ballard acquiring approximately 90 acres between 1820 and 1826. He and his family would live on this land until 1857 when Ballard sold his property to their son, Jesse, and moved to Appleton, Wisconsin to live with their son, Anson. The property would change hands several times during the late 19th century before the Denny family acquired it and owned it for roughly 40 years. The property was subdivided and purchased by the current owners in 1965. Next slide, please. The registration requirements for the associated MPDF discussed today all apply to the Ballard House. It was built in Jefferson County of limestone quarried locally. The use of stone is structural. Walls are intact and clearly visible. The fenestration, lintels, and sills are intact, and the mortar is intact. The building has some alterations, primarily to the uh, wood frame wing, but the stone block section remains largely unaltered. The Ballard House is an example of the countywide tradition of individuals to build in stone. Although it was more costly and demanded more skill than utilizing the abundant timber in the area beyond that needed for framing, flooring, and finished material. This characteristic extends from the stately Luray Mansion to the smallest vernacular houses, some of which replaced log wall dwellings as soon as the means could be found. Stone was the chosen material of choice for a range of reasons, among them personal prestige and stature, and durability and fire protection. This nomination was a collaboration between Ann Barros, Clara Bonney, and myself on behalf of the owners who intended for this to be an honorary designation. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, there's an addition on the second floor, um, and I just wanna pose the question to hold your feet to the fire a little bit. Additions should not overwhelm the original building size or placement. Are we, we safe there? I think we are. We um, in the MPDF we consider that issue, um, and the facade of the building is uh, from the front, from the road. Is it's? I don't think it overwhelms the building. It's it was really only from one angle. I think from looking at from the rear that it's potentially problematic. Yeah. Uh, photo photo five of fifteen shows that view. Yep. But because of the uh, integrity totally right. of the stone block, we felt that that sort of was enough. In yeah, the, I in agree. From, you know, the street view, the front view, it, it, it looks wonderful, and you can't really even see that. I just thought I'd raise that. Uh, it's sure. nice to know and that actually, consider. we considered that specifically when writing the, um, the registration requirements so that, you know, accommodations can be made in situations like this. Excellent. Excellent. Other questions about the Samuel F. Ballard House in Watertown? Uh, I'll move it. 
Can we have a second? This is this is Wayne. I will second. Any objections or abstentions? There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, Dan. Great job. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to Chelsea Towers and the Solomon Resnick House in Chappaqua. Thank you. So this is the Solomon Resnick House built in 1953 with additions in 1967. It's significant under Criterion C as an excellent local example of modernist residential architecture in Chappaqua, Westchester County. Designed by modernist architect Leonard Feldman with contributions by landscaped architect Kanji Demoto and additions by Aaron L. Resnick, unrelated, the house remains remarkably intact to its original design intent. Next slide, please. Built for patron Solomon Resnick, the house is a single story, modern, flat roofed building comprised largely of steel, glass, and concrete. It was designed as an early passive solar house, blocking the sun during the summer and allowing it to infiltrate during the winter, while still accounting for cross ventilation and natural light in each room. The exterior is characterized by a combination of glass walls with black steel mullins, vertical cypress planks, and white stucco on lath. Next slide, please. The surrounding landscape has a significant function as the wallpaper for the house. The hardscaping is a subtle blend of designed plantings and native rock terrain orchestrated by DeMoto, whose work was instrumental in the cohesiveness of Feldman's design. The landscaping plan drew on Japanese traditions and was heavily influenced by Japanese rock gardens. The design is simple and informal without foundational plantings rectilinear flower beds or grass lawns, but rather utilizes extensive moss carpet, stands of temple bamboo, and a variety of ferns, shrubs, and ornamental grasses. As such, it better reflects the native old growth woodland environment and better frames the surrounding view. Next slide, please. Modest in its finishes and straightforward in form, the house represents a highly functional design for the contemporary family unit, centralizing the interior gathering spaces and creating a feeling of openness, transparency, and kinship with the natural environment. Next slide, please. The interior mirrors the material choices of the exterior, thereby creating a comprehensive scheme. The interior space is divided into three principal sections, a children's wing to the south, the parents' wing to the north, with a central great room containing the essential living spaces at the house's core. Overall, the Solomon Resnick House is a combination of Resnick's artistic perspective inflected on Feldman and DeMoto's work. Feldman's design was practical and functional. He rejected the non-essential and shied away from the ostentatious. The materials he chose, primarily steel, stone, wood, and glass, exhibit as they are without ornament, decorations, or coatings. The house is not stark, but rather modest and wholly representative of the modern architectural movement. This is an honorary um, nomination presented to us by the owner, current owner of the property, who's very excited to see it get this far. Any questions? Does the owner want to say anything? Okay. Uh, th this is weird. Uh, I think this is a very handsome modern house. It's hard to believe, looking at these photographs, that it's 70 years old. Yeah. As if it was made last year. Yep. And uh, the landscape also is, is beautiful. There's a somewhere in the nomination it says that it sits atop a 900 foot escarpment. I think it must be at 900 foot elevation because uh, 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 it'd be very unusual to have a cliff that's 900 feet high in the middle of Westchester County. But uh, it's a great it's a great nomination. I'd be happy to to uh, to move its approval. All right, we have a motion from Wint. Any other people want to comment or ask a question? Or do I have a second? Sorry, I could speak her up either way. Well, I heard Erica. I'm happy to second as a neighbor of this community. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, any objections or abstentions? 
There being none, it is approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, Chelsea, and on to Larchmont. Thank you. So this is the Larchmont Avenue Church Complex located in the village of Larchmont, Westchester County, and is being considered for the National Register under Criterion C as an architecturally significant resource whose development mirrored the growth of Larchmont during the 20th century. The nominated church was constructed over the course of three major building campaigns undertaken in 1922, 1930, and 1953, all of which were designed in a consistent neo-Gothic architectural style. Next slide, please. The church's Presbyterian congregation was originally established in 1914 and at the time utilized members' houses as gathering spaces. In April 1915, the organization purchased a plot of land at the corner of Forest Park Avenue, Winlet Avenue, and Larchmont Avenue. To meet the demand of the growing congregation, the building needed to be opened quickly. A decision was made to construct only the church's basement with a temporary 70 by 40 foot half story shingled structure. The intention was to build a more permanent structure at a later date. Next slide, please. Quickly, the church's growing membership called for the expansion of the original complex in 1924. Though the building committee had initially envisioned a single building campaign to include a new church in Paris, parish house with an adjoining manse, they ultimately determined that the parish house needed to be built first in order to accommodate the needs of the membership. The parish house was completed in 1925 in the neo-Gothic style. A new sanctuary was once again put on hold. Next slide, please. In 1928, a general council evaluated the church's facilities, resulting in the trustees and congregation voting to approve construction of a new sanctuary. The decision was made to remove the temporary church built in 1915 and begin work on a new permanent sanctuary to be designed by Otto R. Edgars from the office of John Russell Pope. Ultimately, the neo-Gothic design complemented the existing parish house. Pope and Edgars generally favored the classical revival style for their work, marking this church a rare example of their use of neo-Gothic style. Next slide, please. On the interior, the arches of the sanctuary bear upon the original exterior foundation walls of the basement church, but those walls were pierced by segmental arch openings, still visible today, as the size of the basement was expanded to accommodate the new larger building. A signature character defining feature of the interior is the nave's exposed wood truss ceiling as of the hammer beam type with ex curved braces extending through the cloistry space. Next slide, please. The west window seen on the left, also called the Christ of Resurrection window, was installed in 1947 to commemorate congregation members involved in the Second World War. The window was designed by D'Ascenzo Studios of Philadelphia. Alfonso D'Ascenzo was one of the most prolific stained glass masters working in the United States. Other stained glass windows throughout the church were designed by other prominent firms, including the sanctuary's 1931 rose window designed by Montague Castle, who had apprenticed at Tiffany Studios before opening his own office. Next slide. In 1951, a construction permit was filed for the new education building designed by local architects Robert S. McCoy and Norman Blair. The design required the demolition of the existing manse on Winlet Avenue to, in order to construct a building large enough to accommodate the growing number of students and educational initiatives. Next slide. Shortly after, in 1962, the house at 181 Larchmont Avenue, contiguous to the church property, was purchased and added to the complex. The house was co originally constructed in 1930 and was purchased and renovated to be used and continues to be used as the manse for the pastor. The manse is a good representation of the American four square style featuring the traditional characteristics such as the hipped roof with overhanging eaves, dormers, and a full porch. Next slide. As a complex, the Larchmont Avenue Church is a physical manifestation of the development of the village of Larchmont in the first half of the 20th century, and is a rare and distinguished example of neo-Gothic style ecclesiastical building by John Russell Pope's architectural office, one of the nation's leading architects. We have one letter of support from Assemblymember Stephen Otis for this nomination. 
Any questions? Questions about the Larchmont Church from the board. Uh, the addition of the manse acquired in 1962 and then used as a bookend for the period of significance with such a different architectural style. Does that present any problems for the nomination or did you consider that? Um, I don't believe it presents any issues to this nomination. There was talks about change or um, having a different period of significance given the 1930 construction date, but it really uh, caps off the period of significance while having the acquisition of the property um, and the period of significance here. Okay. Any other comments? Do I hear a motion? I'll move it. This is I'll move it. And this is Wayne, and I'll second it. So who is the first? Tom Maggs. Tom Maggs and Wayne Goodman. Yes. First and second. Excellent. Uh, any objections or abstentions? All right. Approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Moving to James Carter and the Fitzgerald Building in Schenectady. Great. Thank you. Uh, the Fitzgerald building is located at 144 to 148 Clinton Street, uh, side street off of the north side of State Street, which is the primary east-west thoroughfare in the city of Schenectady, Schenectady County. The Fitzgerald building is a locally significant office building being nominated under Criterion A in the area of commerce for its association with 20th century commercial activity and development in Schenectady. It is also significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a representative local example of early 20th century commercial architecture and the use of cage construction. The period of significance extends from the building's construction in 1913 to 1971, which encompasses the tenancies and significant activities of its major occupants, the Fitzgerald Business School and the Turbush and Powell Incorporated. Uh, the Fitzgerald Building has come to us through the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentives Program with a uh, National Park Service approved Part 3 application. Next slide, please. The Fitzgerald Building was designed for cage construction, a construction method that shifts floor and roof loads to perimeter metal columns, leaving the brick masonry walls self-supporting. Cage construction was employed in early skyscraper construction and made possible cost-saving center brick walls, as well as more spacious interiors. It represented a transition in construction methods from load-bearing masonry to later skeleton construction, where the metal frame carries all loads. Well, a late example of cage construction in comparison to skyscrapers built in New York City and Chicago beginning in the 1880s, the construction method is fully expressed in the facade and was a progressive design approach in Schenectady in this era. Uh, the storefront facade has been recently rehabilitated using the federal tax credit program, and it's a contemporary reinterpretation of the original, incorporating the surviving metal columns. The Fitzgerald building was considered a tall building for Schenectady at the time of its construction. The expansive windows representing another tree ushered in by skyscraper technology resulted in well-lighted open spaces on its interior, suited uh, on its interior, which suited the functions of both the early business school and later the insurance agency. Uh, next slide, please. The building was built in 1913 by William Fitzgerald for his Schenectady Business College, also known as Fitzgerald Business School, established at a time when stenographers, typists, and bookkeepers were in high demand particularly by General Electric, Schenectady's major employer. The building was purchased by Terbush and Powell Incorporated in 1923, a pioneer in group insurance and, major local, and a major local employer. Uh, Terbush and Powell moved some departments to another set of offices in 1928, sold the building in 1930, repurchased it in 1933, and surprisingly installed a bowling alley on the first floor. Uh, though the Routers Bowling Academy business was not owned by Turbush and Powell, the insurance agency undertook the construction of eight lanes of bowling on the first floor, adding to the six lanes that already existed on the second floor. Uh, supervised by Schenectady architect J.W. Montross, the most significant change to the building was the two-story concrete block rear addition to accommodate the extra lanes required for the bowling alley. Uh, unfortunately, there are no photos of the bowling alley. I checked. <laughs> um, the company served as the underwriter of the Civil Service Employees Association 1936 insurance policy. From 1948 to 1981, the Fitzgerald Building served as the insurance agency's headquarters, and the interior was converted to open floor plan office space. In this period, Turbush and Powell became one of the top 10 insurance companies nationwide. 
offering a wide range of coverage, including group coverage uh, designed specifically for more than 60,000 state employees. The building is currently occupied by a mercantile establishment on the ground floor, which has retained the building's open floor plan. Next slide, please. Uh, Turbush and Powell maintained its Schenectady headquarters until 1982, so the period after 1971 is not noted for any significant activity at the location for the company despite continued operation. The company was acquired by the Bash Group in 1980. Uh, the $10 million purchase described Turbush and Powell as one of the nation's top 10 largest insurance brokers. The following year, Prudential acquired the Bash Group. A variety of tenants, including a prescription drug administrator, a nonprofit anti poverty program, and an accounting firm uh, have subsequently existed in the building. The building is now occupied by the aforementioned mercantile establishment with residential rental apartments located on the upper floors. Uh, that is the Fitzgerald building. It's connected. Okay. Um, questions or comments about Fitzgerald? This is a Tom Maggs. This uh, building is probably an example Schenectady was probably hit its bottom about 10 years ago, or maybe a little longer. And the downtown was just gone. And if you were to drive through it today, you would recognize that the efforts of uh, to turn this around and has really and Proctor's theater played a major uh, part of that. But this is just one of many, many buildings that I, we've seen transform that are bringing people and businesses back town. Interestingly, uh, with Terrebush and Powell, um, they did a lot of insurance work with involving Robert Moses, uh, huh. Power Authority of the State of New York, uh, a lot of New York City business, the New York Yankees and so on. Uh, and of course, um, with the Civil Service Employees Association, with a lot of politics uh, associated with it uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s and, and so on, but they were very, very active in the um, in the politics of New York State, uh, involved in a lot of uh, business with movers and shakers and so on. But it is really, this area, it's, it's amazing that these tax credits, what they're doing for these cities, it's extraordinary. I would, I would move it. <laughs> All right, any other comments about Fitzgerald building? We have a motion. Do I hear a second? This is Jennifer Lamac. I'll second it. Uh, any objections or abstentions? All right, it's approved by unanimous consent. And we move to Park Mart in Albany. Great. Uh... This is a, uh, I, I'm very happy about this one. I, I used to work in downtown Albany, so I walked by this one every day for a very long time, so I'm happy to see it here. Uh, the Park Mart uh, is located at 93 North Pearl Street, the north-south downtown corridor in the city of Albany, Albany County. Uh, the Park Mart is locally significant under National Register Criterion A in the area of politics and government because of its important association with Albany's urban renewal programs and under Criterion C in the areas of architecture and engineering as a distinctive example of expressionistic modern architecture designed by noted regional architect, Robert Louis Trudeau. Uh, and because of the interesting and unusual combination of construction methods used to enable its function. The period of significance begins with the beginning of design and construction in 1968 and ends with the completion of construction in 1973. The Park Mart has come to us also through the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentives Program with a National Park Service approved part three application. Next slide, please. The structure sits at the corner of North Pearl Street and Van Tromp Street, which provides access to the curved on-ramp to Interstate 787. I-787's uh, downtown Albany ramp was completed the same year as the strategically located adjacent Park Mart. Uh, built to the design of architect Robert Louis Trudeau, it consists of a spiral ramp accessing a garage over a commercial building. This typology recalls earlier parking garages built between the 1950s and 1961 in San Francisco and Seattle, that also provided storefront commercial spaces. The garage combines a sweeping spiral design for the ramps with the use of post-tensioned concrete, a relatively new construction method at the time. Next slide, please. The building was developed as the Park Mart Renewal Project, part of a larger attempt by the city of Albany to revive its struggling downtown commercial area with the overarching context of urban renewal. 
The city's deep involvement in the concept included its promotion by Albany's longtime mayor, Erastus Corning II, who, with the city's planners, was thinking in comprehensive terms on how to reinvigorate the commercial heart of the city. Central to this effort was the need to incorporate vehicular parking in the urban downtown area that would be conveniently located in relation to local commercial interests and linked to the new highway arterial system. The Park Mart was developed with local businessman Joseph Scipioni, who owned several grand cash supermarkets through the city. The architect, Robert Louis Trudeau, a graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, was known for buildings characterized by combinations of both geometric and broad sweeping forms expressed in reinforced concrete and erected using innovative structural solutions, embellished with abstract modern motifs. Uh, in this case, the building was conceived in geometric terms and consists of a polygon-shaped parking garage that cantilevers over the sidewalk combined with spiraling ramps. Angled walls at the ground level commercial space under the garage are enriched with abstract ceramic tile mosaics, uh, one of which is seen in the uh, image on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Well, Park Mart, note the ceilings here. Um, well, Park Mart's spiral ramp was built of traditional reinforced concrete construction, Trudeau employed post-tensioned concrete to support the considerable 63-foot clear span of the garage intended to shelter a maximum number of cars per floor. Post-tensioning introduces steel cables or tendons by threading them through a conduit in the concrete as it forms, stressing them using a hydraulic jack and then anchoring them to the shear walls. The stressed cables provide tensile strength to concrete, which is otherwise strong in compression. In this way, both materials are at their strongest before the building is placed in service. In discussing his design for the Park Mart, Trudeau noted that the strength and utility of the garage relied on a combination of the post-tension concrete and the arch floor supports in conjunction with structurally coffered concrete floor and ceiling platforms, also known as two-way joist slabs or waffle slabs, which removed as much mass as possible. Next slide, please. Despite the optimism for the Park Mart renewal project, the Grand Cash Market, integral to the Park Mart concept, had a short run, lasting just eight years. The project apparently lost momentum after the unexpected death of the Grand Cash Market's owner and the city's development partner, partner Joe Scipioni, in 1970. After the store closed in 1981, the theater company Mart Theater moved into the former store space. The group was the predecessor of the Capital Repertory Theater, a successful local company that subsequently occupied the building until moving its headquarters in late 2019 to the National Biscuit Company complex at 251, 255 North Pearl Street in Albany, which was listed on the National Register late last year. Uh, and that is the Park Mart in Albany. All right. Questions or comments about Park Mart? This is Carol Clark. I think this is a really exciting nomination and I'd be happy to uh, suggest that it be listed on the register. All right, we have a motion to approve. Uh, any other comments? Do I hear a second? Hi, it's, it's Erica Krieger. I will second it. It's nice to see sort of an atypical building type. Yeah, I agree. On our, on our palette here, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, any objections or abstentions? I hear none, and therefore it's approved by unanimous consent. Thank you, James. All right, uh, last but not least, Dan Boggs and the Kimball, I would say Nelly, but there's a punctuation there, Nelly House. Go on. All right, it is Nelly. Oh, I had it. Yes. The Kimball Nelly House in the village of Gowanda, Cattaraugus County, New York, is being nominated under Criterion C architecture with a period of significance of circa 1875 to circa 1913 for the construction of the house and the final addition of the front porch. The Kimball Nelly House is an architecturally distinguished example of the Second Empire style embodying many of the style's ubiquitous design characteristics, including the mansard roof with patterned slate shingles, decorative window surrounds and dormers, wide eaves with brackets, a one-story porch, mansarded tower, and full-height bay. Built to the specifications of master carpenter and owner Charles Kimball, the Kimball Nelly House survives with a remarkable degree of integrity to the late 19th and early 20th century. Next slide. The house is also significant under criterion B 
in the areas of performing arts and art for its association with Polish-born dancer, set designer, choreographer, director, and artist Anthony Nale, who lived here with his wife and fellow dancer Margaret Donaldson on and off beginning in 1942, when he wasn't at his apartment in New York City or on the road touring, and permanently from 1956 until his death in 1977. The main entry to the house is through fully glazed doors on the ground floor of the three-story tower, in which rises a curved stair with ornate stair rail, turned balusters, and a large octagonal newel featuring fleur-de-lis carvings. Next slide, please. The house has double parlors, separated by a cased opening and enjoys ample natural lighting from bays and other windows. Next slide. The parlors also feature original plaster molding, an arched window with floral design, and a decorative fireplace mantle. Next slide. A large and elaborate ceiling medallion graces the dining room. And the original four panel doors with clear rectangular transom shown here are found throughout the house. The Kindle Nelly house exhibits a high degree of integrity and craftsmanship. In 1912, the property was sold to William and Grace Donaldson, who moved into the house with their daughter, Margaret. Margaret grew to have a love of dance and became an accomplished dancer, at first studying under and later performing with dancing master, Anthony Nale. Nale and Margaret Donaldson were married at the Kimball Nale House in Gowanda on May 20th, 1929. Next slide. Thanks, Dan. Um, so this is Kathy Howe and I worked with uh, Dan on this nomination. I'm a lover of dance and art, so I'm gonna get a little bit more into um, Anthony Nale's uh, history here because the house is, as Dan said, significant under criterion B for its association as well with uh, Mr. Nale in the areas of performing arts and art. Uh, so he was a Polish-born dancer, set designer, choreographer, and also an artist. And he led a very long and prolific international career. <clears throat> Though he was classically trained in ballet, he was most known for his extravagant set designs uh, with large troops of dancers. He lived a very peripatetic life, really due to the nature of the entertainment business. And research has revealed only one other property that's extant in the U.S. associated with Mele. It was an apartment building that he resided in at some point in the 40s on um, West 71st Street. However, he would not have recognized the building today as it has undergone major interior changes. By contrast, the Gowanda House that retains a high degree of integrity and represents the final chapter of his long and productive life. Next slide, please. So um, as uh, Dan noted, he married the owner um, of the house here in Gowanda, Margaret Donaldson. This is them on their wedding day in the backyard and it's a very artsy kind of photograph of the two as they were dance partners. Um, he was born um, Bislaw Antoni Nale in Warsaw, Poland in 1894. Uh, next slide. He attended the Russian Imperial School of the Theater in Warsaw and was trained in ballet. But most importantly, he also learned at that school about painting, drawing, music, and theatrical production, such as lighting, staging, and set design. The very early years of his dancing career were based in Russia and Poland, and he's the one kneeling in this photograph here. He's still back in uh, Warsaw at the school. Uh, he joined the ballet company of the very famous Russian ballerina, Anna Pavlova, in 1921, and then he went on tour. The Pavlova tour went all around Europe, ended up in New York City, with a final performance at the Metropolitan Opera House in 1922. Nale was so taken with New York City, he chose not to return with the troupe to Europe, 
he loved the jazz age, the new dance rhythms that he was learning about, and just the general excitement that he experienced in New York City. And it was at that time that he Americanized his name to Anthony or just plain Tony. Uh, next slide. So um, by the 20s, he start, he's still dancing, but he's starting to focus on choreography and stage productions. Um, he opened a dance studio in New York City, New York City studio in New York City in 1923. And one of his dance students, uh, 11 years his junior, here was Margaret Donaldson of Gowanda. And here are some professional uh, views of um, them dancing. Billed as Nele and Donaldson, um, they danced in variety theaters and cabarets and reviews in New York City. And their professional career soon blossomed into a romantic one. One of the places where they danced was Zigfield's rooftop garden atop the new Amsterdam Theater in 1926. Uh, next slide. So um, by the mid-20s, Nelle moved into staging and dancing large productions for what was known as the prologues. These preceded the silent films in the large movie palaces. And he developed these, were, these prologues, these elaborate variety shows were developed by the major theater chains, uh, featuring a live orchestra, singers, dancers, comedians, and so on. In 1928, Nelle was hired as the ballet master of the Roxy Ballet Corps for the Roxy Theater. The Roxy Theater in New York was known as the Cathedral of Motion Picture. He did staging set design choreography and some dance scenes with Donaldson. Donaldson here he's shown with the Roxy dancers. Um, this was very demanding work as they, he had to turn out large numbers of shows because remember the movie studios during this time Every week they're churning out new features, and so they're demanding of the movie palaces new um, prologues, the, the shows that uh, preceded the movies. Now, next slide. This is where it starts to get really, really interesting, and this is what's so fascinating about Nelle is his artistic spark comes to the fore through his paintings for set designs for these movie palace shows. This is La Jaconda Ballet One parody at dawn. This was prepared for a show that he put on at the Detroit Fox Theater in 1928. And it's a wonderful scene of New York City. You've got the elevated train tracks, figures in the foreground, the skewed cityscape of angular tenements and skyscrapers, skyscrapers in these pinks and oranges and blues. Uh, another uh, next slide uh, for that same production. La Jaconda parody daytime, again, showing these uh, Art Deco skyscrapers in these circular radio, radio waves. And next, Nelle's uh, theater paintings, most, most of which, as we're seeing here, were actually pretty small scale in size, and they were produced as part of his creative process to work on his stage designs, his colors, his lighting, um, even costumes. And these were not really thought of as high art to use them in the creative process. Um, though he probably is considered more perhaps an illustrator, um, his fascination with modernity, industry, urban life is demonstrated here in Metropolis One. Um, some of his works broadly show the influence, influence of precisionism, um, a term coined in 1927 by Alfred Barr of the director of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, precisionism celebrates technology and expression of speed through dynamic compositions. Let's look at another kind of fun piece of art by him, um, window cleaners um, here. Again, another urban scene by Nelle. By the early 1930s, what is happening is the silent film era is taken over, that's passing away, and now the talkies are front and center. So. Um, Nelle's work producing these uh, extravagant shows at the movie theaters starts to dry up. So Nelle and his wife head over to Europe to first visit his homeland of Poland. They then head up to uh, London and they're doing a lot of work um, at various theaters. Uh, next slide. And here's a wonderful one. This is called um, Nelle's uh, composition for called The Blast Furnace. It was a painting he did for um, the Foundry Ballet in 1935 at London's Coliseum Theater. 
And it, this, um, the Foundry Ballet was set to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, Symphony. And it's here he's showing these uh, male dancers. They are totally dwarfed by these large scale pulleys and chains. And then you have the female dancer dressed in reds and yellows. She's representing the, the heat of the blast furnace there. And I think that this scene really uh, represents the dehumanizing effects of industry on its workers. Uh, next. Another very dramatic painting called Shadow Follows. Um, while Nale was still hard at work in London in 1934, um, he gets lured over to Berlin uh, to work for the Scala Theater of Berlin. Um, now, while he was opposed to the Nazi regime, it might be said that his very theatrical large scale productions were well suited to the Nazis' emphasis on the use of art for political purposes. Uh, next. So he goes to work training the, Scala, the famous uh, Scala girls, shown here at the Scala Theater. And then it's at this time in the 30s that he starts getting into doing um, choreography and um, scenes for large scale German musical film. Um, think of um, more in our country, the Busby Berkeley style films, only these are German films. Uh, next slide. So here, um, this is a set design for um, Es Leuchten die Stern from 1938. It's a movie uh, called The Signs of the Zodiac. And in this scene in the movie, he's showing you know, set designs and what he wants to have in the background. Um, kind of fun to compare these drawings and paintings with, next slide, his, the actual um, movie stills. And you can still find some of these movies online if you are so inclined to watch them. Kind of crazy costumes here, but that's sort of the actual movie still from that. Um, next. And here he is for that same movie, working on the, the rumba scene here. It's one of these famous, um, she was actually, I forget where she was from, but anyways, famous dancer um, in the uh, rumba scene where he has this lighted stage and all these girls dancing around her. Uh, let's go to another uh, bit of his artwork for another German film. Uh, he's creating just crazy over the top sort of wedding cake scene here, as we can see with this room. The cake revolves, he's got dancing girls on there, he's got revolving, like, overscaled candles. It's just way over the top. And next, um, so while Nale had a, actually, you can go back to that one. Yeah, so while Nale was, had a very flourishing career in German films, he also took advantage of an opportunity one day when he was working outside Berlin in the construction studios of a German film set in 1938. I believe it was. He realized that some of the scaled models that he was seeing behind the scenes at this German movie set, or maquettes as they're called, were being appeared to be the designs for a submarine base and other military installations. So he secretly kind of took some sketches of these and tucked those drawings away into his art portfolio. So. Uh, so with war imminent, Anthony and Margaret Donaldson leave Germany. They arrive back home at her parents' house in 1939. Then they go back to New York City for a while. They're, they go on the show for a road. Next slide. They're touring out in Chicago. This is a scene from his show called Creation that was out in Chicago where you've got the, a, a theater reviewer that's uh, talking about a clear out of this world number against a back, backdrop of planets that might have been done by Dali, so almost sort of surrealist looking. Um, next slide. So when the U.S. enters into World War II, um, Nale is, he, he says, you know what, I'm going to send those drawings that I took from behind the scenes at that German uh, soundstage. He sends them to the War Department in Washington. Now, it is unknown if those drawings of secret military um, designs provided any true valuable information, but Nale did receive commendations from President Roosevelt and General George Marshall for his contributions to the war effort. So he finds that he's got a hard time finding work after the war. So he decides to do a lot of these, spends a lot of his free time doing this sort of anti-Nazi posters and patriotic themed art. And he uses his artistic skills and applies for a job at Bell Aircraft in Niagara Falls. Um, so it, for a couple of years, he was up at Bell, and he's doing some good work there. One of the things he did, he observed that the eye recognizes color 
more readily than it does shape. So Nele introduced a method of color coding airplane parts on the assembly line in order to speed up production. Um, next slide. And um, Nele returned to, actually, is there one between that? No, maybe not. Okay, good. next slide. So, um, so by the 1940s, after he's working at Bell, then he goes back into the theater world. He gets uh, steady summer work with the St. Louis Municipal Opera doing um, summer theater ballets there from the 1940s up to 1960. Now, the Nele's move back to Gowanda. Here they are at, in their older age, um, in their backyard. Um, they still, he's still busy. He's still contributing now to his local community, to Gowanda. He opens up a dance school. The annual recitals are very popular. Um, and he, he lives till um, the ripe age of 83, dying in 1977. So he really is a fascinating figure of the dance and theater and art world. Um, and that is the uh, Kimball Nale House. Um, and we do have um, some next slide. I did want to share this, and I'm not sure if they're on the line. We do have the current owners of the house, um, Nick Weiss, I believe it is, correct me if I'm wrong, and Damien Mordecai. Nick is on the right, I think, and Damien's on the left. Um, so are there any questions? And if the owners, you know, want to speak, of course. Questions about the Kimball Nile House. Uh, this is this is Wayne. No, no questions other than uh, just to maybe a, a comment or two. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed reading this nomination. Um, excellent work. I, I I found the the house and, and this presentation to be very impressive. It, the integrity is so high in the structure and and just the history with Nile was was just fascinating and, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. All right. Any further comments or a motion? Is uh, is Nick on the line or or Damien? Just want to give them a chance. No? Okay. Thanks. This is Kristen. I'm happy to nominate it. Kristen Heron nominates. Do I have a second? Sure. It's Erica. I'll do the second. Erica Krieger. Excellent. Any objections or abstentions? All right, it's approved by unanimous consent, and that concludes the National Register nominations for today. So oh, sorry about adding tap dancing noises here. Uh, okay, the next uh, agenda item is a chair's report. There really isn't one, but there is some board business I'd like to attend to briefly. Um, and I know we're running late here, but uh, I've shared the State Council of Parks material with the board, and I'm happy to receive comments back by email. I'm not sure if I sent the annual report, but I, I'll do that if you haven't seen that. Um, I want to redraw our attention to the 2026 Historic Preservation Statewide Plan, and we're going to get some stuff from Dan McEnany, and I'll be circulating that. But the only the other outstanding issue is this uh, request for bios from the board that Daniel sent by email. I just wonder if people have had a time to comply with that. I'm curious as to who asked about that and what we think is a group of uh, the best way to present that information on a website and if we are gonna include photos. So I open that up to the board for discussion. We've been asked to provide bios to provide a more thorough introduction of who is represented on the state review board uh, we got that from Daniel by email. Has anyone complied with that request yet? Why, this yes, is, but not everyone. This, this is, I'm sorry, this is Wayne. I just had a quick question. So, do you, um, Daniel, do we submit these directly to you? Yes, yeah, I think that would be the simplest intake is to, to direct them to me. Uh, you know, we can uh, maybe make propose some modest edits for length and consistent length from one bio to the next, uh, but. Um, uh, it was uh, you know, it was actually a member of the public who was participating in today's call who simply made an inquiry who are the members of the state review board and you know where are their areas of expertise and uh, you know that's that's um, that's defined by regulation. You all have all gone through an appointment and confirmation process, uh, and I think it's very relevant information to um, to have online. So we will be adding intended to add a web page uh, to the division's um, you know to the division's web uh, web presence. I agree 100%. I think it's a good question and, uh, and it would be a good feature for the website. 
So uh, let's get to doing that as the as board members. I have not complied, but I certainly will. Um, photographs. Uh, you tell me. Um, you know, do you want to be recognized in public routinely for this uh, for this role? Um, I don't know. <laughs> no. I, um, I, so I think I, we I'm happy. Always, I mean, for consistency's sake, for example, there's no no staff have their photographs on our website. So let's. Okay. Not post uh, photos. Um, I know that you know for those of you who are serving as proxies um, for your commissioners or secretaries, um, we will note that, uh, and you know note the formal, um, uh, you know note that you are serving as proxy, but it's your bio that is important for the website. And, and I'll just add, after a year in isolation, I I vote no on the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this is Kristen Heron. Um, Daniel knows this, but um, as a proxy, I have to get this approved by my own agency first. So that is why I am delinquent at the moment. Um, just you know, I don't know if other proxies have that procedure in place. Um, so if there is any template that you prefer. Um, that would help me in presenting this to my own agency to get approval. Dan, this is this is Wint. I assume these short bios uh, should uh, be tailored for this purpose, so so that they emphasize uh, the, our strengths as as uh, uh, appointees to the board, rather than a, a general uh, bio that might touch on other things. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so that was good discussion. That gives us all a better idea of what's expected. I assume you're just looking for a brief paragraph about our, you know, relevant uh, resume items that uh, make us qualified to be on the board. Yes, and so Kristen, I will send you a template. And um, uh, if you don't, you know, if, if folks don't provide us with one, we will make something up about you. So. Uh oh. Okay, I'm happy. <laughs> okay, that that will. Um, Thank you, first of all, for the template. Um, I, I just to be clear, I am happy to do this. It's just we have our own procedures at our agency, so I really appreciate the template. Will help me um, move this along. Yeah, send it to everyone so we can get an idea and be consistent. Kristen, fully understood. We we you know there's um, there is no you know we we would love to have this up and running before the next meeting, for example. But we understand there may be some modest delays seeking exactly the clearance you're you're identifying here. Thank you so much. Okay, and uh, are the dates for upcoming meetings? Um, that's not really a point of discussion other than to repeat them. These are sort of decided on already. June 10th, September 9th, December 9th. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Well, that motion. took Yeah, that took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, second. Tom, thanks. Tom, I, thank you, Tom. Can I say one thing before I, I would just like to congratulate you, Doug. Um, I said, I'm a dinosaur on this. I've been sitting on these things for probably over 25 years and um, you run a terrific meeting in your correspondence and your, it, it's just brilliant. And I also like to, again, I say this every time I won't want to be inconsistent. I would pay any of the staff with my money. I, they are absolutely top drawer and you, I'm proud to be a resident of this state and see that type of dedication, professionalism, uh, they're the best of what we've got. You know, it's very easy to knock the state around and this thing and that thing, but boy, I'll tell you, I am so proud of everyone I've ever had the opportunity to work with in state parks. We had a meeting yesterday with the Saratoga region. They just keep getting better and better and better. And th this was a wonderful, wonderful exchange today. I'm very grateful to have been here. Uh, that's very there. much appreciated, Tom. Thank you so much. And I think that concludes our meeting. Let's end on that. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. See you all soon. Don't forget to turn the clocks ahead. Oh, wow. That's excellent. Bye bye. Bye bye.